Council in attendance, please note that today's uh, meeting is being live streamed on the ncpc.gov website. We do have a quorum, and so we will call the meeting to order, and we will proceed with the agenda as has been publicly advertised. Uh, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman, and I have just one item to note. Uh, first, to express appreciation for Commissioner Provincia, who uh, arranged a meeting, uh, on a site visit yesterday to the um, intelligence community uh, campus in Bethesda that this body has worked uh, on for a good while. We had most of the commission members attend. We uh, met with Admiral Mans Manselman and, and uh, uh, Project Manager Bobby Bourgeois. Um, we looked at the, the LIPS, um, the centrum that's being planned and is being excavated as we speak. Uh, the North Campus and the North Campus Garage, and it was quite a good meeting, and I believe all commission members uh, have a much uh, greater appreciation for the, the magnitude of this project and how it interplays with the surrounding community. And thanks also for, uh, to Shane Detman for doing a lot of the legwork on this, on this project in yesterday's, yesterday's visit. It was very, very good. Um, that's my only item. Anybody else have any questions on that? Um, agenda item number two is a report of the executive director and Mr. Acosta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. I just have a few notes uh, that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, first of all, many thanks to uh, Commissioners May and Steingasser for participating in our recent speaker series event uh, that we held last week that focused on uh, legal planning issues in the national capital region. Uh, we had over 100 people attend this event here at NCPC. I think many people found it to be very interesting and uh, informative in terms of the differences in the uh, planning frameworks amongst the different jurisdictions in this region. Uh, our next speaker series event will be held on Wednesday, April 9th at NCPC. The topic is on the focus of the future of, of public engagement and how social media is transform transforming the way planners work and engage communities in the planning process. Finally, I'd like to note that the uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial Project is scheduled to come before the commission in April for a preliminary review. All submission materials, including the updated design booklet and materials uh, testing studies, have been posted to NCPC's website uh, for public review. And also, we'll be sending you the design booklet and hard uh, uh, cover uh, to each of the commissioners over the next week. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Costa. Any questions for Mr. Costa? Hearing none. Agenda item number three is a legislative update. Uh, Ms. Skyler? Uh, nothing to report, sir. Thank you. Agenda item number four is the consent calendar. We have five items on the consent calendar, and they are uh, agenda item number 4A is the visitor screening facility at the Pentagon Reservation. 4B is the United States Army Transportation Agency Headquarters and Operations Facility at Fort McNair. 4C is the Helicopter Operations Facility at, Joyce, at Joint Base Andrews Naval Air Facility, Washington. 4D is the final master plan for the National Institutes of Health Animal Center. And last, 4E is the master plan for the Naval Support Facility at U.S. Naval Observatory. Is there a motion on the consent calendar? Mr. Chairman. Mr. May. Um, before we make a motion, I would like to raise a concern about uh, item 4A, Pentagon Reservation, uh, permanent visitor screening facility. Um, given the, uh, the discomfort that was clearly expressed by the Commission of Fine Arts with the design of this facility, I am not comfortable moving ahead with this uh, with taking preliminary approval action at this point. Um, I do note that the report does acknowledge that there are still design issues to be resolved, but uh, I think that in, out of uh, um, caution for sending mixed signals about exactly how much work is needed here, I would, I would be inclined to simply remove this from the consent calendar and take this up at another time once there's been further design work. Does your, would your amendment be so specific as to uh, take it off of the consent calendar and to delay it for one month? Um, yes, I'd be happy to do that, and we'll see what, what happens in a month. Okay, further discussion on, uh, so I guess you're, okay, well, uh, for, uh, further discussion uh, uh, on. Not, uh, not making a motion per se at this moment. Right, just, 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 further, uh, just, just discussion on the, on the uh, agenda item number 4A. There's no motion yet. Uh, would, Ms. Wright. Uh, even though it's not a motion, I would, oh, Sorry. It's not a motion I would support, Mr. May. Okay. I'm also inclined to just have another look at the design. Okay. Further discussion? Ms. Provincia. In opposition, respect <coughs> opposition to the uh, positions of my uh, fellow commissioners, the uh, 
I don't. I wouldn't characterize the CFA concerns as troubling. The 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 the, nat the language that was carefully selected by Mr. Lupke is along the lines of request a more thoughtful design. A couple of the specifics has to do with circulation, exterior architectural compatibility with the exterior of the Pentagon, since it's immediately in front of and adjacent to the Pentagon, and uh, thoughts about interior lighting, how to improve that. Very consistent with the uh, executive director and staff's comments about uh, improved lighting, uh, protection for visitors as they queue up. All of those, the Pentagon is absolutely receptive to, uh, to uh, ad addressing. I believe this project was initially submitted for both preliminary and final. The position that uh, we're absolutely comfortable with the position that the executive director has recommended that it be reduced to preliminary only, and our commitment is again to, to follow up. While our commitment to follow up also does not extend to, we agree to provide covered walkway at this time within the scope of this project. I think we've got some very tight um, scope and funding limitations. As we have done with other security projects at the Pentagon, um, covered walkways have been provided subsequent to, uh, to other security efforts. There was one called the security push-out, where we rearranged and separated the flow of uh, employees from visitors and uh, folks that also were transiting from the very active Pentagon Transportation Center to either the Air Force Memorial or, or over to the Crystal City, Pentagon City area. So uh, I think we have a solid track record of being responsive, and we want to re reconfirm that uh, commitment at this time in conjunction to with these uh, comments that have been made by both CFA as well as the NCPC staff. Uh, one, one question: Are there any construction constraints that a one-month delay would uh, would? Calls. It's my understanding, based on what I'm getting from from the staff that are working that, the any delays at this time we. With preliminary approval, we can continue with some of our planning, design, studies, and analysis efforts. Uh, I, I don't know that it would have direct uh, negative impact on construction, but planning, design, studies, analysis, this is a, a utility-intensive area, both uh, power and water. It's uh, very, very close to the uh, Pentagon Metro Station uh, tunnel. There's some structural things to be analyzed. so. If we could proceed with those, I don't know there will be a delay for construction. As you know, with many agencies, DOD is probably singular in, in, in not necessarily a positive way, and we have very, very narrow and tight programming and funding efforts. Sometimes when our designs slip, we can delay the project as much as a year, perhaps even two. So that, that would be a concern that we would uh, have. One follow-up question before I turn it to others. Yes. If you could proceed on, I mean, if if the concern is over architectural treatment, right. is there any reason you can't, con and we delayed it for a month, is there any reason you can't continue on on utility and the other kinds of issues that perhaps no, shouldn't? I'd, correct. I, I do not think our efforts to proceed with our planning is not contingent upon the decision today, whether it's preliminary or final. But we clearly, pre preliminary is and and did an interim step toward final. So we would we would leverage that opportunity to get the NCPC and CFA endorsement. Again, we'll co we'll come back and address the issues. Understood. Thank you. Other comments? Design proceeds. Mr. Mr. May. Um, yes, um, I, I I would agree absolutely that um, the, the track road record of, of the department is uh, very strong and being responsive. And I expect that that all of these we'll design that. issues will be resolved and will be resolved with a with a uh, an excellent design solution. Um, however, it's where we are right now that concerns me. And I would note that the Commission of Fine Arts in their comments went well beyond simply the aesthetics of the building. And they're talking about the o a need for an overall plan that demonstrates the full scope of the intended construction and a detail, a detail analysis of pedestrian movement between the entrances, the metro station, and the, tra and the uh, adjacent transportation <coughs> complex. All of these things point to, I think, larger planning issues that are, are very clearly in the domain of this commission and have the potential to significantly affect what we approve today. And while I, I certainly do not want to slow the necessary progress of this project, I just feel like there's too much that's up in the air. And I think at the very least, have, putting it off, even if there is no further progress, progress with CFA within the next month, at least allowing a month so that 
the staff can look at this more thoroughly so that um, the department can, can uh, rebut any concerns that we might have um, in an, an open session item. I think that probably makes more sense. Further discussion, Ms. Ms. Ryan? Moreover, um, although the, the – um, as the recipient of these letters on a monthly basis, there is, <laughs> they are exceedingly diplomatic, the letters. Um, however, when I get a letter from CFA that says they're requesting the submission of a new concept design, this is not nipping around the edges of, of details. This is kind of go back to the drawing board language. So I'm sorry, Mr. Provancha, with okay. all due respect. And it's no, it's no, um, it's, there's no doubt that, that the, DOD will be responsive, but responsive um, doesn't isn't going to cut it here because it it really is start start think think this through again from from the beginning. So I would urge that we take it off for reasons of just having a. a I would need to see more um, in terms of. Um, some drawings, et cetera, um, to understand the design intent at the very least. Mr. Dixon. Chairman, I have just a question. Uh, let's assume that we go forward and fine arts does not go forward. Does fine arts stop the project as we would stop the project, or would we have more weight on this in terms of our action than fine arts would have? Or we, I just, I'm not sure if we go forward and we do things based upon our analysis, as an agency independent, making our decisions, and Fine Arts Commission finds it has issues, which we see in writing, and they decide not to be favorable. Do they stop the project? Or are they advisory? Or are we advisory? Or what's, what's, the, what's the strength here? I'm just trying to find out. It's my understanding that they are advisory and we are approval. Okay. So the project no, could. No, also, no, also, also advisory. advisory. This is a project in the region. Oh, so yeah. that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. So, so whatever we do, yep. it doesn't have any weight in terms of what Fine Arts Commission might want to do. I mean, it's we may be guided by them. They may set our agenda and may set our decisions, but I just don't know whether or not we gain anything. If they have to come back to us, uh, DOD, to make some changes because of their reaction to Fine Arts, then, right. we, then we deal with that. But, on, on, on the process, I, let me return, uh, turn it to Ms. Mr. Acosta. Well, just for your information, there is a meeting scheduled for next week uh, between NCPC, CFA, and the applicant to kind of go through these comments again. So if you do delay it a month, uh, we could hold that meeting, kind of see where, you know, if they're able to resolve uh, some of these issues. And if you prefer to have this presented as opposed to on consent at the next meeting, we can certainly do so. Mr. Provincial, a couple of points. Uh, and, no, and no matter the outcome, we'll continue to promote and sponsor site tours. So we're, we're not gonna... <laughs> if you'd like us to amend it to stop those, we were happy to. <laughs> um, two points. The language in here, I acknowledge uh, Commissioner uh, Wright made the point. It says, the CFA letter says a new concept design. I don't think they really mean a new concept design. I think they mean an update or a revised design that addresses the concerns as opposed to Throw out what you have done, go back to the starting blocks, and submit something that's entirely different. And if it comes back looking like the original one, one of the comments, one of the approaches I used to use in the Air Force, that's probably why I went so far, was uh, when somebody would submit a request, we would say, disapproved, <coughs> resubmit for further disapproval. <laughs> I don't think that's going to apply in this second. There is, there is a legitimate and valid concern later on where it talks about uh, Let's have an overall plan that tells us what informs us what's going on on the uh, on the east side of the Pentagon. I think that's legitimate. At one time, we had enough funding and enough scope that we were able to combine a security project for the metro entrance itself, some new types of turnstiles that improved security access, that allowed us. Uh, that was in conjunction with, and it was a, a kind of a, a bundled two-part, each complete and usable, which allowed us to separate out the visitor center. So if it would be helpful, we're glad to provide the other information about the, the plans for the metro entrance facility, which would, be, would shift from a mixed use by visitors and employees to mostly employees uh, only. However, 
by separating these these two projects, it allowed us to proceed with the design for the visitor center itself as opposed to the changes for the employee's entrance. So that was one reason why a complete plan wasn't submitted, because we weren't submitting two projects that were going to be either planned or constructed simultaneously. This one will proceed with the uh, metro entrance for uh, employee security to follow. So. Is there a motion? Motion to approve the executive director's recommendation to this proceed as a consent item subject to preliminary approval at this time. There's been the motion on 4A specifically. Is there a second to that? Sorry, that was specific to 4A? It's specific to the items on the consent calendar. I'm, I'm flexible if you want to break out 4A. Um, yeah, as I would offer, offer a friendly Perhaps amendment. the motion is to approve the consent calendar. Appro okay. Okay. Exactly. Revised uh, motion then to approve the consent calendar. Is there a calendar? second as to approve the consent calendar as before us, all second. items? It's been I, I, I would like to offer a friendly amendment, if I can. Is that the right procedure? Or a substitute motion. Substitute. Well, I would offer a substitute motion that we approve uh, consent col uh, calendar items 4B through uh, 4D. Is that right? E. 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 e probably. 4E. Sorry. 4B through 4E um, at this time, and then address 4A separately. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded that the substitute motion is to approve the consent calendar items 4B, 4C, 4D, and 4E. Uh, sensing no further discussion, all in favor of that substitute motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Uh, 4B, C, D, and E are approved. Uh, remaining before us is 4A. Um, I would make a motion that we postpone uh, action on 4A pending further discussions by staff and that we take it up at the next meeting, either on the consent calendar or as, a, as a, an open agenda item. It's been moved that 4A, it's been moved and seconded that 4A be delayed by one month and be taken up at the, at the next uh, meeting <coughs> to be determined whether it's consent or, or an open agenda item. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. It's approved with one, okay. one, one opposed. Two opposed. Two opposed. Uh, Mr. Provencia and Mr. Dixon. Agenda item number 5A is the, visit, is the visitor screening facility at the Washington Monument. We have Ms. Hirsch. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The National Park Service has submitted preliminary site and building plans for a new visitor screening facility at the Washington Monument. Located on the National Mall, the monument sits on a large prominent site within the monumental core. Um, <clears throat> you see the outline of the monument in the grounds here in yellow. Uh, the monument is the central element in the grand vista along the mall between the Capitol um, <clears throat> the World War II Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, and the reflecting pool along the east-west axis. <clears throat> it's also the central feature in the view corridor between the White House, the Tidal Basin, and the Jefferson Memorial. To review the primary features on the site, um, <clears throat> you have the monument itself, a 555-foot uh, masonry obelisk. Uh, vehicular perimeter security barrier that was constructed in 2006, uh, outlined here in purple, and then the granite plaza that uh, circles the monument at its base with the flag poles around it. Uh, the existing temporary visitor center here on the east side of the monument, and then the monument lodge to the east that was constructed in 1888, and then <clears throat> outlined here in light blue is the Sylvan Theater. Uh, the monument has an extensive history that I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on, but uh, the history can be traced back to the L'Enfant Plan um, when the site was specifically called out as a memorial for the nation's first president. It was constructed over two phases, starting in 1848, um, and it was completed in 1888. <clears throat> it was listed in the National Register in 1966, and in 1980 that was amended to also include uh, the surrounding grounds. 
Um, so what's important in understanding about the monument as a historic property is that it is a cultural landscape. So along with the monument itself as a structure, character defining features <clears throat> on the site include uh, the spatial relationships between the monument, the plaza, the open lawn that surrounds it, <clears throat> views to and from the monument, um, also views from the top of the monument, <clears throat> circulation systems, uh, the topography, and vegetation. Um, this also includes uses such as the commemorative uses, the public gathering spaces, uh, recreation, and visitor use that's um, occurred over the history of the site. Um, since the monument opened in the late 19th century, uh, <clears throat> there's been visitor use has included access to the top of the monument. Um, approximately 600,000 people uh, visit the top of the monument every year, and um, well over a million visit the surrounding grounds. <clears throat> character, as I mentioned, the character defining features include the views, and so here you see an example of one of the views um, from the top of the monument towards the ellipse and White House. <clears throat> here you can see the existing temporary screening center that was constructed at the base of the monument. It, as I mentioned, it's intended to be temporary when it was put in place. Um, the purpose of the current project is to improve the security and visitor flow at the monument in a manner that both <clears throat> preserves the character and visitor experience of the monument and the surrounding grounds. Included in that um, is to take into account the security and cultural resource management requirements, um, which just briefly what, that, what those are, are to locate the visitor screening, um, visitor screening process outside the actual walls of the monument, <clears throat> to maintain visitor use to the top, and to preserve the historic fabric of the monument itself, and also to maintain um, consistency with the monument the surrounding grounds in terms of the buildings that are located on the property, uh, <clears throat> the views and vistas and circulation. So since 2010, the project was last before the commission in 2010 as an information presentation. Um, the Park Service has been working or worked to develop a wide range of alternatives. And essentially those can be categorized into four groups. Um, the first would be uh, constructing an underground visitor screening facility that would be accessed through the landscape. The second would be <clears throat> accessing a visitor screening facility through the modifications to the plaza <coughs> itself at the base of the monument. <coughs> the third would be um, replacing the, the temporary facility with a new facility on the plaza itself. And they also explored some options of um, conducting screening at either the Sylvan Theater or the Monument Lodge and then having um, visitors escorted up to the monument itself. So this larger group of alternatives was narrowed down to the six that you see here on the right. <clears throat> and actual physical models of those were constructed um, in order to understand the impacts um, that the project would have on the monument and the surrounding grounds. Um, and the focus of um, constructing the models um, and studying the impacts was on the monument as a cultural landscape <clears throat> to identify the impacts to the historic fabric of the monument itself as I've mentioned, the spatial organization of the site, views, um, circulation, and topography. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just going through um, <clears throat> the models that were constructed in these six alternatives just to give a broad context in terms of understanding how the preferred alternative was uh, arrived at. So the first four models focus on the approach of going through the landscape to access an underground visitor facility. So this particular alternative was the ramp at the plaza perimeter <clears throat> and essentially looked to add a system of ramps on the east side of the plaza in order to gain access, um, that's in this location here, um, in order to gain access to an, the underground facility. So essentially visitors would use the existing pathways to get up to the plaza and then <clears throat> um, access the ramps to come down into the visitor uh, facility. So here you're looking at the model on the left. Um, the actual monument itself has been removed and you're looking at the foundations. <clears throat> so you can see that with this alternative there would be um, significant impacts to the foundation of the monument itself in that historic fabric would have to be removed for this alternative to be successful. In addition from the renderings on the right you can see um, there would be <clears throat> impacts to the distant views from the National Mall and the surrounding monument grounds. In addition, the, this alternative would, all of the alternatives, I should say, will impact the spatial relationships of the site in terms of the monument, the plaza, 
and the surrounding landscape. So the next alternative was um, <clears throat> is the east axial concourse, and essentially uh, this called for an approach through the landscape from the Monument Lodge um, down a ramp into an underground facility here. Um, you can see that, that it would be sort of a portal in the landscape that visitors would go into and un into access an underground facility where they would be screened before going to the top of the monument. Um, similar to the previous alternative, <clears throat> you have impacts to the historic foundation of the monument um, with historic uh, material having to be removed, um, impacts to views and vistas from the mall itself, and also from within the grounds of the monument looking back towards the mall. And then, um, as I mentioned, the changes to the spatial uh, relationships on the site um, would also be present with this alternative. Uh, the third alternative um, <clears throat> looks to add um, a system of ramps and walkways to the north, or sorry, yes, to the north and to the south of the monument, rather than on the east-west axis. And essentially, again, visitors would um, use the existing uh, walkways to get to the top of the plaza, and then from there, um, gain access to these ramps that would bring them down <clears throat> to the uh, visitor center. And similar to the, uh, the other two previous alternatives, you would have impacts um, to the, um, the foundation of the monument itself, Oops. the foundations of the monument itself, as well as views. Um, <clears throat> in addition, um, many of these alternatives require the addition of safety barriers. Um, which would impact views while, while one's standing on the plaza looking towards the north or south, as well as if you're standing on the mall looking towards the monument. Um, the last alternative in this, this group of through the landscape essentially looked to add, looked to add um, ramps to the east and the west side of the monument, also to gain access to an underground facility. <clears throat> And essentially, again, um, you have similar adverse effects on the landscape, um, alterations to the foundation, oops, the foundation of the monument itself, this time on, on both sides, the east and the west. <clears throat> and um, in addition, with the addition of safety barriers, you would have the similar impacts to views um, while standing on the mall looking towards the monument, or if you're on the plaza at the Washington Monument looking out. This next model um, shows <clears throat> the, a different approach of adding to the monument. This would be adding a new pavilion at the base of the monument, um, essentially with an, a more aesthetically appropriate solution than the current facility today. And what's important to note here is that there would be um, no impacts to the historic foundation of the monument itself. Um, obviously, there would be changes, <clears throat> as with the other alternatives, in terms of adding a, a new building on the plaza. So you would be changing the symmetry of the, of the plaza itself um, and obviously altering views towards the monument. Um, however, um, the benefit to this alternative is that there would be actually no physical changes to the historic structure of the monument itself on the foundation. And then the last alternative um, <clears throat> of these six looked to essentially um, modify the plaza um, to remove an existing row of benches in order to insert a ramp that would bring visitors down um, into an underground screening facility. Um, so you can see that modification here. Um, essentially, a ramp would be, the benches would be removed, a, a ramp would be inserted in the plaza to bring people down um, to the underground facility and then um, access the monument. Again, with this uh, alternative, you have impacts to the actual um, foundation of the monument itself in terms of the removal of historic fabric. Um, and then this alternative would obviously require safety barriers uh, around the ramp in order to keep people from falling down. Um, if anyone's standing on the plaza, and so there would be um, similar impacts to views and vistas, both looking towards the monument and also when one's standing on the plaza looking out back towards uh, the Federal Triangle or the mall. 
And so essentially from those six alternatives, ultimately three were carried forward uh, through the NEPA and Section 106 process, and you see those three here. Um, the freestanding pavilion option, <clears throat> which was identified as the preferred alternative ultimately. Um, the ramp at the plaza perimeter, which was um, the alternative that would modify the east side of the plaza um, with a system of ramps to bring people down to an underground screening facility. And then the third that was brought forward through the NEPA process was the um, alternative to create a ramp in the plaza itself. Um, so several reasons for um, the pavilion on the plaza is to be selected as the preferred alternative. Essentially, the new pavilion was seen as being the least intrusive option. Um, it is reversible if screening is no longer needed in the future. It would minimize impacts to the historic fabric of the monument itself, as all the other options would have required modifications <coughs> to the foundation and uh, the removal of historic fabric. <clears throat> in addition, there was a lot of discussion during consultation about this being the most direct route through the east facade, and that that was preferable over a circuitous system of paths or ramps that would lead down to an underground facility. And also, there was discussion about how the recent perimeter security project, um, the system of elliptical paths and retaining walls, is a good example of perimeter security and therefore should be protected. <clears throat> so with the selection of the preferred alternative, uh, the program requirements were further refined, and here you can see um, the full list of program requirements. Um, just to highlight a few of those, full visibility was required um, from the facility outward for the park police to the north, east, and south. However, at the same time, they did not want people to be able to see into the, the facility to see the screening process as it was going on. Um, in addition, uh, circulation in the facility um, was designed to be somewhat deliberately circuitous to avoid anyone having access to a direct path into the monument. <clears throat> and finally, um, egress was also ne needed to be managed in a way such that visitors who um, had been screened and got, gone up to the monument were then not allowed back <coughs> in after they had exited, so that there would be a separation between the screening and those um, exiting. One thing to point out, um, with the selection of the pavilion as the preferred alternative, the facility is required um, to have a significant blast and ballistic rating. Um, so then, <clears throat> moving forward with design development, essentially, uh, the Park Service studied various options for the facility in an effort to arrive at an ideal de design solution that would balance security screening with um, preserving the historic character of the monument. And essentially two design vocabularies were developed. The one on the upper left that you see here um, <clears throat> was referred to as a pure cubic form, and the one on the bottom right here is known as either a portal or passageway. Um, <clears throat> and you can see in these renderings that essentially this, the pure cubic form essentially has equal dimensions. Um, all facades were treated equally in terms of their materiality. Whereas in contrast to the portal or passageway, um, the form takes on more of a rectangular shape and the expression of the structure essentially helps to frame the entrance um, and therefore it makes it very clear that you enter the facility from the east. Um, during consultation there was a good deal of discussion that with the pure cubic form there could be some confusion because of the treatment, the equal treatment of all sides that how do, where would you actually enter the, the facility. And so in some ways, the, the, this led to the preference for the pe portal or passageway. In addition, there were comments um, from the Commission of Fine Arts. Um, they noted that the pure ge geometry of a cube next to the pure geometry of the obelisk or the monument <clears throat> essentially were um, the two forms were competing with each other and that it was preferential to have the security screening take a secondary role obviously to the monument. Um, you don't want this new facility to detract from the significance of the monument. And so those comments along with comments from the consulting parties that the structure should um, be as minimal as possible in terms of its scale and footprint led to the portal or passageway as the um, option that has been forward, forwarded for the commission's approval. So um, here you see another rendering of the pavilion um, as it is proposed. It will sit beside the monument 
And the same location has the existing on the east side. Um, it will function independently, however, and only be connected in a very minimal way. Um, the design proposes to use a double glazed envelope, <clears throat> essentially, with the outer layer, which will be a laminated glass. Um, it will have to have a ballistic rating um, with a metal mesh insert, and then on the interior, there will be another layer of a laminated glass. Uh, the roof will either be a fritted or tinted glass, and that is to allow um, visitors as they enter the, the facility to look up and uh, see the monument. Um, so here you can see the proposed floor plan um, showing the circulation path. Upon entering, visitors will queue to be screened um, and then enter through the east door of the monument. After they've gone to the top and are ready to exit, there's um, a separate exit route that is provided. The new uh, screening facility is approximately 800 square feet, slightly larger than the existing at um, 450. And then, as I mentioned, um, because of the selection of the pavilion um, as the preferred alternative, a threat and um, blast analysis is required in order to determine the appropriate rating for the facility. Um, this work has not yet been done, and <clears throat> it's possible that it could influence the selection of the exterior material choice. Um, as well as the foundation and structure of the facility. And so therefore staff is recommending that the commission request and the Park Service submit that information um, so that we can understand the factors that will influence the final material selection. In addition, staff is also recommending that um, or noting that the commission note that uh, glass is preferential to the use of a polycarbonate material for aesthetic reasons. To heat and cool the facility, um, the Park Service is proposing to use geothermal wells rather than any kind of rooftop mechanical equipment. A preliminary location for the wells has been identified to the north of the monument, um, but there will not be anything visible after these wells um, have been installed. And staff is recommending that <clears throat> uh, the commission request detailed information on the wells to understand what, if any, impacts there would be to the monument. Finally, um, the lighting for the new facility has not yet been designed. Um, therefore, staff is recommending that <clears throat> the commission request a lighting design um, that demonstrates how the building will be lit and to what intensity um, to ensure compatibility with the nighttime illumination of other memorials and monuments on the mall. Um, overall, the project is consistent with policies in the comp plan, including the historic features and preservation element, as well as the visitors element. Um, it is also consistent with the national mall plan. In addition, uh, the NEPA and Section 106 processes were used effectively in terms of arriving and identifying a preferred alternative, and therefore staff is uh, supportive of the project. And it is the executive director's recommendation to approve the preliminary site and building plans for the visitor screening facility at the Washington Monument, to adopt the National Park Service's finding of no significant impact for the environmental assessment, <clears throat> to note that the use of Laminated glass is preferential to the use of a polycarbonate material for the exterior of the facility. And to request um, the following information, a detailed plan regarding the number um, <clears throat> and location of the geothermal wells uh, to ensure that there will be no impact <coughs> to the monument and its foundations, um, the blast and ballistic analysis that will inform the final material selection, and the lighting design um, to show how the facility will be lit. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch, very much. This is uh, uh, historic. It's not every day the Commission considers such a public physical improvement to such a noteworthy structure. Um, discussion among Commissioners? Mr. May. Uh, Mr. Hart, excuse me. <laughs> I, I have a question. You mentioned that the glass would have a wire mesh embedded in it. Why that instead of a plastic layer that would be transparent, maybe? You know, we, we looked at a lot of different treatments, but maybe I'll just go ahead and ask um, the uh, designer of this to, to of the facility to come up and speak to this question. So, um, Honey, this is Honey Hassan of Buyer Blender Bell, who's been working on the design of this project for what seems like decades, but it's only been about <coughs> three years, right? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just for the record, my name is Henny Hassan. I'm a partner with Barbara and the Bell, responsible for this in incredible undertaking. Uh, 
As Mr. May said, we've been uh, working on this very diligently and very seriously to make the right decision, not only in terms of positioning the uh, new entrance uh, to the monument, but also in terms of the impact and the texture and the materiality of that, uh, uh, of the new entrance. Uh, one of the, uh, the several reasons that guided uh, this decision, uh, some of them are uh, aesthetics and some are practical reasons. Uh, from the uh, practical reasons first, uh, the introduction of the wire, uh, of the wire mesh uh, will introduce uh, some sense of, um, of diffused uh, vision uh, from the outside in because uh, while the screening activity is occurring, uh, uh, we did not want anybody to see how that activity is occurring. So you could, you could see through it, but you don't see clearly. So it's kind of a diffused view of all the screening activity that is going through, uh, while you're going through. Uh, from aesthetics point of view, uh, it also, it, uh, it will create, uh, when, when the, um, uh, when you are looking from inside out, uh, it will also allow the view to the extent of the monument uh, ground. And at the same time, uh, we also intend that there is going to be a very soft lighting. I know lighting uh, issue was mentioned. There's going to be very soft lighting within, uh, within, that, um, within that entrance, and that will diffuse that uh, as well. So it was multiple reasons uh, how uh, how that decision was made. The last uh, point I'll make is with the portal uh, scheme, uh, given that the entrance is only from the east, uh, that texture is only occurring on the outer shell of the portal, uh, but there is a clear, uh, clear glass and clear view when you enter the monument uh, from, from the east. Uh, so you could see all the way up to the uh, body of the monument itself. Hope this helps. So this wire glass is only going to be used inside. Uh, it, it is used. Uh, it's laminated between two layers uh, of glass uh, on the um, on the outer on the outer layer of the glass. And if the ballistic uh, glass is, we're, we're going through that study now. Our preference is to put it on the outside because of the um, because of the distortion of. Uh, of you looking through a thicker uh, piece of glass. So this is gone under study right now. But I just wanted to address the whole issue of the, uh, of the laminated uh, glass. Okay, I, th I think with the solution that is being presented, the glass is a very important part of this. And it would be worthwhile seeing mock-ups of the glass or the alternatives in order to make a, an educated uh, judgment on you know whether this is appropriate or Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would just uh, mention the fact that uh, we have also built uh, scale models uh, for that entrance in itself, not a small model, but a relatively large model to study those various options. Uh, but uh, a mock-up would be pertinent and very important to make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other... Mr. Miller. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the staff for that very good presentation. Uh, this is certainly a vast improvement over the temporary facility that's been there for almost 13 years. Um, the glass, I, I, so I, I'm supportive of the portal concept uh, for this, and uh, the materials, the glass is very attractive. Um, but, uh, and I understand why it's almost twice as big and square footage because you're adding functions in there that aren't there now, an office, a restroom facility for the park police. And, but um, uh, you're also, so it's 785 square feet versus 445 square feet. That's a little bit of a concern that it's a, it's a large, it's so much larger structure um, up against this iconic historic uh, monument. Um, but what's, more, what's a little bit more disconcerting is the uh, almost 50% increase in height um, it's the existing facility is 10 is 12 feet and this is 17 and a half feet and so I just wonder what the uh, uh, rationale is for having uh, increased uh, height uh, as I 
mentioned to Commissioner May previously, uh, I couldn't help but taking on a height issue uh, <laughs> with, with him, um, especially in such a historic setting. Um, so I, I, I would think we would want to be more conservative here, but maybe I can hear the rationale. I'm sure there is a rationale for what it's not functional. It must be aesthetic. It must be more attractive that it's higher. Um, it, I, I will. I'll, I'll do some. Make some attempt to, to respond. But again, I, I, I invite uh, Hani Hassan to, to join in as well. Um, it is, uh, I think, largely an aesthetic reason. I mean, there certainly is a functional reason for having more than just an eight-foot ceiling, um, given the uh, the necessary air circulation and, and the things that need to happen. There's a lot going on in this building, um, and we're trying not to take up floor space with mechanical equipment, things like that. So it, it does involve, um, you know, carefully planning uh, air movement and things like that, and the higher ceiling um, is going to help in that regard. The, um, but it is, it is to a large extent an, ex a, 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 um, an aesthetic decision because the, the, the portal itself had to have the right proportions. And we did look at buildings of varying heights. I mean, you'll, you saw the cube, which was actually quite a bit taller than this. Uh, in a more perfect um, uh, geometric form. Uh, and we looked at some things that were lower, and uh, it really, you know, they really came off as sort of a smashed pancake kind of thing when it's that, when you're next to something like the monument, it had to have a, a certain amount of that, um, uh, of the, uh, I guess, the appropriate height to, for the entrance. But again, maybe, Honey, do you want to add to that? I'm afraid anything I'll add to this, I will just uh, not do as good of a job, but I'll, uh, I'll mention the fact that, uh, just to compliment Mr. May's uh, uh, explanation, is that we've studied uh, that uh, very thoroughly. Uh, the reason we, um, we went to the portal scheme partially, not only just to enter from the east and have a clear access uh, to, to the monument, uh, but we felt that when we worked with the cube configuration, uh, was, uh, we felt that we were forcing the geometry of the cube onto that whole uh, uh, concept. So the portal uh, gave us the opportunity to adjust that height appropriately to what is appropriate in terms of proportion to enter such a significant structure. Obviously, the monument is... Uh, is majestic and it's uh, and it's very tall. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I always felt that as you enter that that cube or this portal, you have to have sufficient height of a sense of being uplifted, or kind of more of a not necessarily lofty, but nevertheless something that is not uh, low and oppressive in terms of a lower headroom, which is the current facility. Is it feels like a sort of like a like a little bit of a downer going into this amazing structure. So that was just about the fine line of the proportion in terms of height that we felt it would be um, most appropriate. Yeah, I, I think some of the other images that we looked at of, of things that were shorted, shorter, um, kind of con conjured the wrong associations. We looked at some of them and we saw, I don't know, the rough proportions of a fast food joint or a, or a toll booth or something like that. And it needed to have that, the, the grandeur, some of the grandeur of the building itself that you're entering into. I appreciate that explanation. Do we have any images of the, of the shorter uh, Other fast food joint <laughs> height, the 12 foot height or 14 foot height? You could drop down Rockville Pike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that you have anything on your, I mean, we have the image that was in the EDR itself, but other than that, I don't know that we have any other. You have, uh, honey, you have something that, that shows a shorter image? <coughs> Nothing that's shorter. Uh, we could provide all these uh, studies. I mean, we don't, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I have it here, but not really. Yeah. It's not in the, uh, I have just this document. That it shows something less than 17 feet. Seventeen 
Ms. Wright and then Mr. Dixon. Ms. Wright. Um, I actually think that the proportions are exactly right and much better than what we've seen. It has to be big enough so it's not a carbuncle. I mean, that's the trick to these things. Having said that, um, I regret the port the portal scheme. I, under, I, I regret the selection of it. The, um, since you made it, I don't think you can do it better than this. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but I really would love to about preservation policy run amok about this whole business of reversibility, which is the, the, the primary tenet that we all hold dear. But sometimes common sense just ha should intervene. I'm just saying. So there goes my soapbox. I got on it anyway. I, I just wish that we would recognize sometimes that there are some things that are here to stay. And, um, Perimeter security, like the same the same argument for perimeter security, we are unlikely to ever enjoy the freedoms that we once did um, at our memorials and monuments. And I, I I would love to have seen one of the other schemes developed because I think they were so much less um, um, interruptive, disruptive. Um, but if you're going to disrupt, you, again, I, I, there's no better way to do it. And I've had the pleasure of working with Hanny and his team on several of these um, interventions. And uh, if you must, um, then then this is certainly the most elegant solution I can imagine. And I don't, I, I can't find anything wrong with the design, which is of course so. Right. boring not to mm -hmm. you know lead a charge but I, I would I would lead the charge to approve this um, because again having selected the portal <coughs> key, I think it's as good as it gets and I think it needs the height um, I really do so that it doesn't seem uh, something short of a gesture but um, I mean, more than a gesture, I don't know, it's just hard to get right. Um, and I think they've got it right. Mr. Dixon and then Ms. White. Ms. White. Um, I appreciate your comments about reversibility because that struck me as well. It's like, that's not going to go away. It's um, trying to make the best out of a bad situation. Um, but I, And I appreciate the sensitivity to the design, and, and I agree the portal's uh, you know, given the situation or good resolution. I'm more curious about these geothermal wells, and I know that the, the uh, proposal is that we would get more information, but, you know, perhaps if the designer could talk about that a little bit, um, what will we be seeing, and what if the geothermal system doesn't work? Then what's the fallback plan? Because I know right now we don't want things on top of the roof for air conditioning and heating. But if we find that geothermal isn't going to work, what's the alternative? Um, maybe I can just go ahead and speak great. to that. Um, first of all, we have significant experience already with geothermal wells and other facilities um, on the mall. We use them for our uh, concession facilities, most notably. And we are planning um, additional uh, geothermal um, uh, wells for other installations. Um, typically, uh, geothermal wells are planned with excess capacity. And what happens is that if for some reason, and there are, they are individual wells, and if an individual well fails, it's simply cut off from the rest of the system and everything else that's there can carry the load. And they design it with enough redundancy in the system, enough coverage, so that you know, even if the, the, the worst imaginable happens in terms of failures, you don't wind up having to go in there and you know, install new wells. Um, you know, the, the fortunate thing that we're dealing with here is that we're not constrained on the landscape. There's a lot of land there and to be able to install them. So if we need a field that's a bit bigger than what's there, we can do it. We, you know, we're trying to find the best place to make it um, as, uh, you know, the least dis possible disturbance. Um, but there's a lot of, of ground in which they can be installed. So we, I mean, I, I think this is almost ideal. I've had to deal with geothermal uh, in other installations where the site is very constrained and you're dodging tree roots and, and other subs, you know, significant buildings and so on. We don't have that here. This is going to be a, um, a pretty straightforward geothermal installation. Does that answer your question? 
That's what I was looking for, because otherwise, I mean, we're waiting on that. Right, and I mean, we'll certainly provide all that information as we move it further along. Thanks. Mr. Provencia, if you are seeking screening facility revenge against Mr. May, <laughs> now is your chance. No, no, sir, I'm, I'm going to take the high road. <laughs> rise, rise above, turn As the other cheek, expect. et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> now, my comments are along. I appreciate Ms. Hurst's uh, presentation about the previous A through E alternatives and then the, how it was refined down to the new pavilion, the ramps at the, at the perimeter versus the ramps at the plaza. It looks like the, the driving criteria or the, the factors were used to discount option A through E were things like uh, distant views and vistas, um, use of, uh, the term was used, uh, historic fabric. I'm assuming that that means the stones in the plaza are historic fabric as opposed to the materials of the obelisk, the monument itself. The, the thing that just troubled me was it looked like all of the ramp options, if the proper planes and elevations and smart berming was used and a little bit of... Uh, curved uh, pathways that all of those would be entirely invisible because they're at, at the, the plaza level. So I was, I was troubled to see the, the ramps uh, so <coughs> easily discounted. Further talked about uh, some program requirements that were modified appeared to be after the alternatives were proposed. Was this a situation where we had some design criteria and we used that to eliminate eight or five, five of the, or six of the alternatives? And then subsequent, we determined an, uh, the alternative approach, and then we added more criteria that would say, oh, obviously, the glass pavilion port portal type of, a, of, a, of an option is the one that uh, clearly has to meet the criteria. As an example, it was uh, of the exterior glazing. It was described as if you're standing outside looking into the building, you have this diffused and uh, uh, clouded uh, image so that you cannot observe security operations, which makes absolute sense. One of the criteria, though, was um, on page five, on page six, was full visibility outward to the north, east, and south. Now, if this is not one-way glass, isn't also the view of the operators inside performing the security obscured looking outward? So at least one of the criteria is not met by the clouded. Glass, uh, glass materials. A um, cu couple of questions about the utilities. I'm assuming that the equi equipment going into the new new facility will draw exactly the same amount and type of power as the temporary facility. So you, there's uh, existing adequate existing power on site. You won't have to bring any new utilities of any kind to include how do you connect the geothermal wells that are quite a distant, separated from the facility, without going into the foundation of the which was used to rule out several other options, but it seems like with the geothermal wells, you have to go through the historic fabric and the foundational materials. So I, I'm just trying to, to, to reconcile some of, the, some of the comments. Finally, a couple of other things. Is there a staff entrance? I'm, I'm just, I couldn't see whether the staff could get into the facility as opposed to having to queue up and say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, security coming through, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. So it's a normal practice have a separate facility. Realizing again, ramps present the normal challenges that we have here in DC, snow and ice removal, skateboarding, graffiti, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes uh, ramps are not the uh, option. The uh, glass, well, I, well, the glass pavilion structure is very uh, novel. A couple of concerns that we have is uh, we've talked about frequently exterior, compat exterior architectural compatibility. For example, was not some kind of a stone-clad, ob small, miniature, obelisk-shaped pavilion also studied and evaluated? Would, would hope that it had been and would be curious as to why it might have been, been uh, excluded. Massing, the massing is very different on page 8 versus page 11. And it appeared even on, on one page that the, this building was offset a little bit. It wasn't square up to, for example, the on figure five on page eight, it appears that the building is, is offset. But on page uh, 11, we have three different uh, figures. So I'm, I'm curious as to which one this is. It appears to be the center one, the medium-sized structure, which is square on the building as opposed to offset. 
Which uh, so which which one is accurate? Um, do you want me to answer this? Yes, please. Okay. Do you want to answer all the questions or just that last one? Because uh, I, I have answers for all of them. Oh, one more thing in favor of reversibility. Uh, uh, agreed that it's, it's regrettable, but it's a sign of the times that we live in. The one benefit, though, of having uh, a, secure, a, a screening type facility is I think it can help if the security was to go away entirely and you pull out all of the equipment, you still have a nice covered queuing space so that staff, the uh, uh, tour staff, can control and assimilate and protect the in, protect from the elements as opposed to protect from security threats, the, the visitor. So I think there's some benefits to the initial investment in security facilities with the reversible feature as you just pull out the screening equipment in the future. But then it wouldn't be reversed. Right. If you're talking about <laughs> reversible of the entire structure, correct. Right. Par partially reversible. No. So back on the issue of uh, massing and structures and... Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to take them as in, well as the exterior in, compatibility of a glass structure in, versus this. Uh, right. In, um, this so as I kept track of them from the beginning. Okay. Um, Good luck. You the uh, the the, the, uh, uh, the ramping schemes that you thought might have been uh, too easily discounted. Right. Um, and uh, I would just say that uh, the ramp schemes were not easily discounted. In fact, those were favored by um, many within the Park Service very strongly. And um, it was through an, uh, you know, extensive discussions with the many people who were involved in this project from uh, agency staff, this agency staff, Commission of Fine Arts, State Historic Preservation Officer, and uh, Section 106 consulting parties. Um, this is how we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was simply to improve the, or replace the existing um, screening structure on the surface, that all of the other that there were too many other issues that were raised having to do with the ramping schemes, uh, not the least of which is the concern about disturbing the foundation. Oh, absolutely. And, I acknowledge that. And, and also significant removal of soil. I mean, we would have had to do things like remove a similar amount of soil on the other side and filled it with a lightweight material to sort of balance out the weight so that we don't have, you know, and you know as an engineer, you know that soil behaves as a fluid and so you need absolutely. to keep it balanced. Right. So all of that um, that was all part of the, the discussion, and so I, mean, I wouldn't say anything about this this design effort was easily discounted. Um, as far as the power on site uh, and whether the geothermal wells or anything else will disturb the foundations, um, they would disturb the foundations for the relatively newly laid um, plaza, um, but not the foundation of the structure itself, which is actually quite a bit below that. Um, and we didn't show any of the historic photographs, but the foundation for the monument itself is quite a bit below the surface. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what, what we see in the early photographs is how much it was, um, how much lower it was and what was built up around it to shore it up as it was, as the building was completed. And then the soil was brought up above that. So there's, there's a layer there that we can work with for running utilities and such. A, a layer that could be penetrated as opposed to existing openings that couldn't be utilized. Did well, to some extent there's, pipe, there's some existing pipe, infrastructure there, but I don't know the full extent of it. But, okay. um, what we can do there, we can do, I think, relatively easy with, uh, <laughs> easily with shallow trenching. Um, the staff entry, uh, there is not a separate staff entry. There is a rear door. I don't know if it actually would be used for that, but the key thing to understand about this, the way the, the structure will operate, is that uh, groups will queue away from the building. We basically line them up along the benches at the perimeter at 20 or 25 at a time based on what their time ticket is. They show up there a few minutes early, they line up, and then when they are ready to go into the building, we walk them over to the building and they go in. So the door, the front door will be unobstructed for our staff to come and go. Um, we did look at uh, stone clad versions of this. In fact, some of us uh, in the Park Service strongly advocated for, for those alternatives. Um, and in the end, it was the, uh, the glass structure that, mm -hmm. that won out because of its, um, relatively speaking, um, a, a sort of lighter presence on the, on, the, uh, on the plaza. Was the heat load that the glass might generate from both the exterior glass as well as the glass roof considered? Um, DC is famous for hot, muggy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. About yeah. This I mean, it, that, that was definitely one of the considerations. 
And uh, there is, you know, we, we also didn't want to create highly reflective surfaces, and so that's why it's, it's going to be a complex assembly of glass. Sure. And uh, we are, you know, hoping to turn away significant solar radiation, particularly in the, uh, you know, what falls on the roof. Um, but yeah, all of that. Is, I mean, I can't say that it's all been figured out yet, but this is absolutely I been a concern. I interrupted you on the point about uh, stone cladding on the exterior. No, we, well, I mean, all I was saying is that we studied it studied fairly it thoroughly, and the, and the glass uh, won out in the end. Um, and um, the last thing is that there. I don't know. I, I realize some of the drawings may be a little bit. Um, misleading, but everything that we studied in terms of uh, these pavilions were centered on the centered. monument, okay. and so there was no offset. The only things that varied were how far away from the building, how much of a of a hyphen structure there was, because you mm -hmm. see that the the portal itself is connected with a narrower section. Right. Um, so that that's was the the uh, significant variable variable so that answers what I think were I think so your questions mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if, unless anybody has other questions I would like to move approval of the executive director's recommendation it's been moved and seconded that the EDR as, a, as before you uh, be approved further discussion hearing none all in favor of the EDR say aye aye opposed no it's passed <laughs> Agenda item number five B is phase two of the of the Intelligence Community Campus, uh, the renovation of the Erskine and Robodeau halls. And we have Mr. Detman. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Uh, as you've already noted, uh, staff is here today to, re to uh, present its recommendation uh, on the ICCB, or Intelligence Community Campus Bethesda, Phase 2 uh, Erskine Hall and Robodeau Hall uh, renovation project. Uh, just a couple upfront uh, announcements. You should have received uh, the written testimony uh, from one of the community members, Mr. Harold Full, who's also here uh, with us today uh, to speak. Uh, I'm going to be passing around um, a material sample board uh, for you to uh, take a look at during my presentation. And then lastly, um, on January 30th, the Montgomery County Planning Board reviewed this project um, and voted to submit comments to you. Uh, however, staff has not received the formal uh, signed comments by the Planning Board Chair. Um, I do have the comments uh, included in my presentation, which I'll summarize for you. We were supposed to receive the formal uh, signed comments today, but we haven't received them yet. Um, uh, but again, I do have the comments for you. And so uh, by now, I believe you should know generally where the, uh, where the campus is located. It's located in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. It's approximately a 30-acre campus located uh, not far from the Maryland uh, and district border. Uh, here, and the site is outlined in red. Uh, you can see uh, the site in uh, relative uh, proximity to uh, the Potomac River, which is about a, um, the facility is about a quarter mile east of the Potomac River. Here's another look at an aerial photo, uh, which was taken prior to any of the work uh, taking place on the north campus uh, here. But again, you can see the campus here, uh, which is, um, at the time this photo was taken, was largely um, uh, impervious, covered with impervious <coughs> surface, uh, surface parking lots with a collection of fairly outdated um, uh, low-rise uh, buildings uh, tending towards the south end of the campus. I can't quite see the scale. Is it about 70 feet above the river? So um, the, uh, when you look at it here, it's, again, it's a quarter mile from the Potomac River, and it's a, a height differential of about 125 feet. Um, around the, to the west of the uh, campus, as I said, is the Potomac River, as well as uh, National Park Service land with MacArthur Boulevard, the Clara Barton Parkway, and the CNO Canal uh, running in the north-south direction. Uh, to the south, to the north, is largely single-family detached, uh, medium-density uh, residential uh, with a local school and park immediately on the north uh, border of the site. And then across the street, which is Sangamore Road, which provides the access to the site. Um, and on the east side of Sangamore Road is a large uh, sh uh, commercial shopping center. You'll recall that in February of 2012, the commission approved a master plan for the complete uh, revitalization of the ICCB campus. That master plan, which is shown here, divides the campus into two halves. The north campus, uh, which 
Uh, the improvements were inclusive of a, a new parking garage uh, and a, a new visitor control center and vehicle inspection station, uh, as well as some access improvements uh, and removal of substantial amount of impervious surface. These improvements, uh, um, which for those of you that attended the site visit yesterday, uh, you notice that are largely complete. Um, and now the applicant is moving on to the redevelopment of the south campus, which is uh, a lot of building construction along with um, a substantial amount of uh, site improvements which will happen in a, at a future time. These are just some photos uh, showing some existing conditions. These were taken in January and February of this month. Uh, the top photo you can see um, an image focused on the south campus um, with the two buildings that we'll be looking at today. Um, the, uh, a building called Bear Hall was recently demolished in order to make way for the construction of a, the Centrum building, which you approved in May of last year. And then here you can see an overall shot of the campus with the Potomac River in the background, and you can see here the, north, the nearly complete North Campus improvements. And so what we'll be looking at today, which is uh, a renovation and a, and, a, and a facade replacement for two of the buildings on the site, uh, but what we'll be looking at today is really sort of the next step in the applicant's uh, efforts to completely transform the architectural character uh, of this site, which was begun uh, in mid last year uh, as part of the Centrum project, which you can see highlighted in there. The Centrum building is that building that's going to interconnect all of these um, fairly poorly connected, uh, as they exist today, uh, buildings into one uh, consistent uh, campus. Before getting into the actual uh, description of the proposed facades for Erskine and Robodeau Hall, I wanted to take you through. Uh, just quickly, the, the proposed facade palette, uh, which you see a, a photo of the mock-up which is on site today and which you observed uh, yesterday. Um, the, uh, the primary facade material is composed of a copper uh, color aluminum panel system, uh, which is, has a, a vertical, which will be installed with an er a vertical orientation. Uh, here, the copper colors will consist of a range of four different uh, hues of copper. There's another uh, galvanized steel metal panel system which will be used in certain places to frame openings and frame um, uh, gl um, uh, window glazing systems. Uh, there are facades that use a combination of the copper metal panel system uh, and vertical uh, oriented windows. There's the, um, the glass curtain wall glazing system. And then along the base of the two buildings is a precast architectural, an architectural precast uh, concrete uh, system which you can see here. And so this is a, a rendering of the ICCB South Campus redevelopment and the site plan concept, which was presented to you earlier last year, uh, and then outlined in red are the two buildings that we'll be looking at today. One is Erskine Hall, which was, uh, which was the first building built on the site back in the 1940s, and the original home to the Army Mapping Agency, and then Robodeau Hall, which dates back to, I believe, the 60s or 70s. Here's a photo um, taken from Google Street View showing the existing uh, character of Erskine Hall. It's a, it's a six-story building. Uh, composed of a facade of uh, red brick as well as some precast lighter color vertical banding at the entrances and along the north and south facades as well. And so what's being proposed is a, is a complete redo of the, uh, of the facade as you can kind of see in this rendering. And the applicant has, has oriented the new facades along an east-west axis which is showing here. Uh, so sort of um, taking advantage of the views out to the community as well as down onto a historic landscape. Um, which is within the ellipse, the, the ellipse uh, driveway uh, on the south end of the campus, and then views out towards the adjacent parkland and the Potomac River. And essentially what, how the applicant does that is sort of applies sort of a veil a, across the north and south uh, facades of the building, opening up views to the, to the east and the west. And so here you can take a look at uh, the, a, an, an illustration of the north and south facades of Erskine Hall. Here you can see that combination of the copper metal panel system on the north and the south with the vertical uh, glazed windows. On the north side of the building that, that fronts upon uh, that ceremonial gath gathering space that was part of the Centrum building, uh, at the base the applicant is including a row of uh, glass curtain wall in order to provide views in and out of that courtyard. And along the south side at the base of the building uh, is that architectural precast um, uh, stone, stone material that kind of creates a plinth or a base for uh, the building uh, to the upper floors to sit on. Uh, the, the, the sort of belt line uh, that's established by uh, this base material generally corresponds with the existing belt line of Erskine Hall, so sort of uh, paying respect to the existing massing and articulation of the, uh, of the building, which is, which is historic. Along the east and the west, this is looking at the, the east facade 
and the applicant is carrying that precast system across uh, the base of the east facade and then the upper floors will consist of uh, largely a glass curtain wall system framed with a, uh, that, uh, the, the other metal panel system, that darker gray metal panel system, and this is a rendering of what uh, that facade will look like. On the west side is very much in contrast to the east side, and that's largely done for two reasons. One is to try to tone down uh, the amount of glazing, which was part of the original concept. They wanted to have glazing on this side of the building. Uh, but in order to uh, reduce the amount of glare and the visibility of this building from the Potomac Palisades and the River Gorge and the adjacent parkland, uh, as well as reduce the amount of glazing to prevent uh, the potential for bird collisions, which was a, which a big, big focus of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission staff. Uh, they went with application of that uh, precast system across the entire west facade of Erskine Hall uh, with a random array of, of punched windows to provide light into uh, the office spaces that are there. Yes? Would a grayish color scheme not work, or is the black for a particularly strong reason? I, I, think, I think what you're seeing here is, is a combination of two things. One is that, um, based on the mock-up that you saw today, it's slightly darker. Uh, but I think you're also seeing a little bit of a rendering issue here, too, just like you did with the renderings that you saw last year where the, where the building facades looked very, very brilliant orange, and now they're kind of toned down to more copper color. Uh, but my understanding is that also the color of this, this facade is, a, is of interest to the community. Uh, they'd like to tone down it a little bit to make it a little bit more gray or charcoal, and I believe the applicant um, is willing to entertain that. They're still calibrating uh, certain things with these materials. So final decisions have it, there's time to still make a decision. That's my understanding, and the design team is here as well as they can, they can address that comment um, um, directly. Moving on to Robodeau Hall, this is a view taken from Sangamore Road towards the existing uh, Robodeau Hall. Uh, Robodeau Hall is a three-story building. It has um, two full floors. The upper floor, the third story, does not extend the, ex the, the entire footprint of the existing building. That's going to change with the current proposal. The applicant, in addition to um, putting an entirely new facade on this building, will be building the third floor out uh, to the existing edges of the footprint. And so, as I mentioned, Erskine Hall is sort of oriented along an east-west orientation to allow views out to the historic landscape and the parkland. Robodeau Hall is, is oriented. The application of the facade it orients the building along a north-south facade in order to uh, take advantage of views down onto the landscape, which will um, be installed at a future date. And partly as part of the, uh, the Centrum project, there's some bioretention and all that uh, in this area. And then to the south, to the historic landscape. Uh, in order to do that, on the west side of Robodeau Hall, where Robodeau Hall attaches to the Centrum building, they're doing a, a full application of that copper metal panel system, and then transitioning over to the east side of Robodeau Hall, uh, where the building is closest to Sangamore Road, closest to the community. The applicant has decided to um, utilize almost the full range of pallet materials with the architectural precast on the base with the two upper floors kind of floating on top of the space uh, with the combination of the vertical uh, windows and copper metal panel system. Just one uh, specific point on the east side of Robodeau Hall. Uh, you may recall that in early 2013, this was the South Campus architectural concept that was presented to you in an information presentation. And there were specific comments made about kind of the solidity of the east facade of Robodeau Hall. And the applicant uh, took that comment back uh, and refined the east side of Robodeau Hall in order to um, kind of articulate that with windows and allow light into this uh, space, but also reduce its scale and, and, and the degree to which it kind of imposes upon uh, the pedestrian experience along Sangamore Road. Uh, another thing that you can pick up on in these renderings is that at the South Campus concept, the idea was that the penthouse level of Erskine Hall uh, would be covered over uh, with that facade veil, as I described, um, in an F partly in an effort to reduce uh, the scale of Erskine Hall. Um, they decided to not cover over the penthouse. The penthouse is going to remain as it is. It's going to be painted a lighter color, um, um, and it's not going to be expanded um, at all. On the north side of, on the north side of Robodeau Hall is proposed that the precast system on the base uh, with the galvanized steel panel system creating a frame uh, around a, a glass curtain wall system. The frame is a bit offset or uneven. Uh, on two sides, uh, this, uh, the larger application of the metal panel system here 
uh, essentially masks an egress stair that leads down to the ground floor. There is another egress stair here which the applicant has decided to um, apply a, a glazing there. And then on the south facade, uh, the applicant is, is applying a combination of the, of the copper panel system and the vertical windows. Uh, this was partly uh, due to the need to, because this is a south facing facade, there's a need to kind of control and regulate uh, thermal heat gain uh, because of the direct sun exposure. Moving on to staff's analysis, uh, we find that the, uh, the proposal, the facade improvement project, is consistent with the policy of the comprehensive plan. It really extends the applicant's efforts to transform this outdated, this existing outdated federal facility uh, into something that's innovative um, and uh, modernized in order to create a great work environment for the future tenants of the facility, as well as something the community can take, uh, take pride in. It's also consistent with what was contemplated in terms of the complete uh, renovation of the existing buildings on the site contemplated in the ICC master plan uh, with refinements. This was a rendering that was included in the uh, master plan document that the commission approved in 2012, uh, which showed a much more monumental approach. It was a very innovative, a, a high-tech approach. It was a glass and uh, metal um, facade approach, but instead of creating that one very long linear uh, monolithic facade across the north and south of the, um, the campus, the applicant decided to see what it could do to relate to how the facades are uh, um, articulated on the other side in order to relate to the community a little bit more, uh, as well as try to retain the massing of some of the existing buildings on the site. Uh, as I noted, Erskine Hall and Robodeau Hall uh, are considered to be contributing structures uh, to a historic district that exists on the campus. And as part of the MOA with the Maryland Historic Trust, uh, they were required to retain those structures. And so um, they're taking off the facades and retaining the structures and uh, applying a, a much more modern, innovative approach, but also allowing these two buildings to retain their own identity as individual masses on the campus. Uh, and this is just, uh, again, the, the, this particular project that's before you today is the next step to the applicant's um, efforts to um, implement its original South Campus vision that was presented to you uh, early last year. Very quickly on stormwater management and, and forest conservation, because of the limited um, area of disturbance with this project, uh, there isn't a state or federal stormwater or forest conservation requirement for this project. However, we know that uh, this, the, the revitalization of this facility has garnered a lot of discussion in these two areas, and so I wanted to put this in front of you. I won't take you through every single bullet, uh, but one bullet for each of the four th things here. The North Campus is largely uh, complete. It's fully permitted uh, by MDE for stormwater management, and it has a, an approved forest conservation plan um, um, that resulted in an MOA with Maryland DNR. Uh, the Centrum project is almost nearly complete in terms of stormwater management. The final uh, permit is imminent. Um, the campus-wide stormwater management plan, which was presented to you as part of the Centrum project at a concept level, the applicant continues to uh, advance that plan towards the 35% level. Uh, we recently um, held a meeting with the community to solicit their input on the landscape, and there'll be two other meetings, uh, one in March, one in May, I think, um, to solicit their input on stormwater management. That third meeting will pull those two together into a comprehensive site improvement plan. Uh, for that project, uh, that will be, the concept will be approved by MDE, and then it will be constructed in phases, which will be individually permitted for stormwater management um, for each successive phase. Finally, in terms of the off-site erosion remediation, which um, uh, the applicant has committed to uh, in its letters to the community, uh, DIA and the National Park Service have um, finally executed the memorandum of intent between the two agencies, which kind of lays out the framework for how uh, the remediation work is going to be analyzed under NEPA and constructed by DIA. DIA. Uh, that was uh, completed in August of 2013. NPS. It's currently in NPS's hands and they're in the process of procuring for the NEPA process. We expect the NEPA process to take 18 months with construction to take place about uh, for over the course of 12 months. The applicant has con continued its efforts with community coordination since the master plan uh, stage and this is just a summary of the meetings that have taken place thus far uh, in the different venues. It's in the EDR and I won't go too much into that. The planning board uh, provided, uh, voted to submit the following comments uh, to you. Once we receive them, we're happy to provide you with the actual document. Um, based on the recommendation of MNCPBC staff, these were the comments that they submitted. 
uh, related to the continued effort to calibrate the color of the different facade, facade materials that the applicant is currently doing, uh, to proceed with the National Park Service, uh, to coordinate with them on the facade materials. Um, I'll note that the facade proposal was shared with the National Park Service, and we received confirmation from them that they had no concerns. Uh, to continue efforts on outdoor lighting and to identify after the buildings are built and occupied what, what operational measures can be taken to reduce the amount of light emanating from the building. Um, and then to, um, there was a, a last bullet point about the need for ongoing maintenance of the landscaping, which the applicant is on the hook for um, in accordance with the terms of the MOA with Maryland DNR. It's also going to be part of their comprehensive uh, campus-wide O&M contract for the maintenance of the, uh, the long-term maintenance of the facility. And with that, it's the executive director's recommendation to approve the preliminary and final building plans for the ICCB South Campus Erskine Hall and Robodeau Hall renovation project. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Detman. Commission members. I have a question. Can you, um, I'm sorry I missed it. Yes, Your microphone. Sorry. Very sorry I missed it. Had to bag out at the last minute. And uh, I, I, could we see again <clears throat> specifically the south facade of Erskine? South facade of Erskine, <coughs> sure. This one here. <coughs> okay, so I'm confused. I have to admit, I, I'm, I'm confused. Um, so the the south okay so the west facade of Erskine can we see that next the okay so this the top this you you're saying that the color of the skin is is probably more like the top image than the bottom and this is post adjustment by after the neighborhood has asked for the palette to be changed or this is their response no i think that i think that if you were to see the mock-up on site um which had the precast system there for you to look at it was somewhere sort of in the middle of these two and the applicant is still sort of calibrating uh that color based on input from the community okay not good. so this is not necessarily final I mean, right? Is the design team here? Uh, thank you, commissioners. I'm Bill Baxley, the uh, design director for Leo A. Daily. Um, we are, as, as Shane were, uh, says, we are still calibrating that palette. I think since we have, you know, it's all one material, it's got to be uh, the right color. Uh, and the right texture. Um, and so, um, as with concrete, uh, you know, we don't necessarily want it to be a big gray concrete wall. Uh, we want it to receive, we sort of think of it as a shadow behind those sort of filters of trees before you hit the Potomac. We just haven't found that right mm -hmm. uh, mix yet. So yes, it's in play right now. Um, can we see that the perspective rendering of the whole campus from Sangamore, please? Yeah, the before and after. I, I, I think it's so much better. I wish I had made it, really. Um, it's so much better than it was, I think, um, on, on Robodeau. I'm, 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 I, I can't help feeling, though, that Erskine was, was is, is that a, or the, the, those can't be design decisions that you made that were just driven by the design, right? Well, if you remember the process, um, when we did the Centrum project, uh, right. we were asked as part of that proposal to do a little dreaming, if you will, of context. What could that be? And so, uh, which every architect loves, you know, it's absent a budget, absent a, let's give us some ideas <laughs> of what that might be. Um, and uh, so that generated that first, you know, the idea of these uh, shells uh, over the buildings, you know, those little thin lids to help break down the scale of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we did that. We had this idea of these covered porches and, and uh, uh, some really interesting things there. So when we, uh, when the task order two 
uh, comes out, now we have a budget, now we have, everybody liked that direction also. How do we preserve some of those ideas kind of moving forward? And I think that's resulted in the, uh, the sort of light, latest iteration there. Um, so the answer is that it wasn't just driven by design, but rather by reality. That's, fiscal, that's very well put, fis yes. Fiscal constraints. You. Yeah, fiscal constraints. That's Too bad, because yeah. I think the Erskine dream was much better. If we could do Garanimals design and put, you know, the old Erskine with the new Robido, it would be just dandy, but I guess yeah. not. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's been an interesting uh, sort of process there, yeah. too. But uh, I think it's, yeah. it's, um, I think that once again, you know, the community has been, has made itself known to good effect, I think. That doesn't always happen, but I think this is a good story. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have n nothing to say. I, I think it looks great. Um, uh, and you have more to do, but, um, <clears throat> what are we, what, what are we looking at preliminary and final or just preliminary? What are we doing here? It is, um, it is preliminary and final building. Yep. Okay. Mr. Mr. Provincial. I'd like to say, uh, make met several comments in support of the uh, executive director's recommendation. First, first of all, on the credit for the tour, let me de defer that. Uh, I appreciate the, the the role I played as a senior executive was when the idea was proposed was immediately to violently support it and try to claim it as my own, which I cannot in good conscience do. But then my role was to step out of the way and let Mr. Detman and others execute what was a good idea, so I can't take any credit for that. There's there's many, many positive aspects about this design. We appreciate the historical perspective as we've seen this project mature. Stormwater management, deforestation, I think the final analysis was less than two-tenths of an acre of forest materials were removed, and some of, uh, there's been, was it 50 plantings? Since uh, since then, the, the the parking ratios 1,800 spaces for 2,900 staff, transportation planning, the public outreach has just uh, con con continued to improve. Collaboration with all the uh, regulatory agencies that was covered, I think, on slide 25. The covered walkway concept, which is uh, which has been added, that'll connect both the garage with Maury, and I think ultimately uh, down the road with the visitors control center, a another positive aspect. The uh, preservation and continued respect for the contributions of Mr. Roberto, who was a civil engineer and surveyor. He lived uh, 1763 to 1829 and participated with LaFont in some of the planning of D.C. before they were both let go by President Washington. And also uh, Mr. Erskine, who was a geographer and surveyor general with the Continental Army. It's great to see that historic preservation, historic heritage preserved. The, the garage, I think we saw six, maybe seven or eight or nine reiterations of the garage. Uh, the, the shaping, the massing <coughs> change, the uh, excavation was at 150,000 cubic yards of soil in order to depress the garage. The, the many, many accommodations to the neighborhood uh, homeowners associations to turn off lighting, for example, at night on the upper levels of the garage that are visible from the surrounding uh, neighbors to the north. Uh, little things. The, we were told that there was a shroud that was fabricated. There's a red, yellow, green light at the visitor's uh, vehicle inspection facility that they fabricated a shroud in order that that light won't detract f or uh, in any way from the folks out on Sangamore Road or the neighboring uh, school. Just, just one more uh, positive aspect. The finalization of the MOU with the Park Service the preservation of the historical Ellipse Drive, the uh, access uh, across the covered sidewalk to the Pepco substation at the north end of Maury Hall, uh, on and on and on. This, the, the creative design for the Centrum building itself that would link all the existing, all the buildings that will remain, Maury, Roberto, and Erskine, I think is, is, is very clever with the, I call it the periscope, the, the sideways periscope. Uh, design of those uh, of that central spine i think uh, very very creative the only uh, negative things that we have s uh, that that uh, can still be addressed uh, down the road include i haven't seen the bike share station yet so hopefully that will be included in uh, in future concepts 
Uh, it's uh, great to see the executive director and staff recommendation to uh, approve without notes, without requests, without any follow-on uh, uh, terms and uh, terms and condition. And uh, the last point I'd like to make. Oh, there's a in the schedule that was given to us yesterday. Uh, it appears that there's a lot of activity in the 16-17 time frame, but it's unspecified. And I think the follow-up questions we learned was there that should have been cut off in the f or approximately the fourth quarter of 16. So we know that the heavy construction activity is the 14, 15, 16 time frame, and there's very little other than move in and so forth in the early 17 time frame. So that was one minor correction. And lastly, in a uh, poor but absolutely well-intentioned homage to uh, Johnny Carson <laughs> and, Car and Karnak, the answer to the question is signalization at Sangamore Road and the Sentinel intersection. <laughs> And the question is, what will Montgomery County and the residents regret not doing, doing in conjunction with the ICCB project? <laughs> Signalization along Sagamore Road. Moving 1,800, or, or excuse me, moving 2,900 folks morning and evening onto and off of that campus through a four-way stop intersection is not practical. Let it not be said that you didn't want them. When you get the bike share station, they won't really need it. Okay. okay. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Hart? Yes, I think this, this project has gone forward with considerable progress from the original submissions that we saw uh, some time back. And I think that uh, the willingness of the client to you know take our comments into consideration and move forward has been much appreciated, uh, particularly in my respect with uh, the comments about uh, forest conservation, stormwater management, I think we're ending up with a plan that uh, is really exemplary for the kind of uh, conformance to state regulations and embracing those uh, requirements as well. So thank you to, to the cooperation, and uh, I think this is a good project. Mr. May. Yeah, I, I would want to uh, just second that uh, that notion I mean this project has really come a long way and um, we're pleased with how far it has come and to, to have started off where we did and be at the point where the remaining topic of discussion is not even the color of the building but the shade of the color of the building <laughs> um, I think it's pretty remarkable so um, I'm and I uh, look forward to uh, seeing this finally completed and uh, also look forward to other projects uh, brought forth by uh, the Corps, maybe not the Defense Intelligence Agency, but the Corps of Engineers will bring us many future projects, and may they all go so smoothly. Our projects as well, I think. So, anyway, thank you. We, sensing no further comments, we do have one. I'm sorry, oh, Ms. White? Okay. Yes, go, go ahead. I just wanted to echo the comments and commend the design team for the attention to detail and the extensive dialogue with the community I think has made it a much better project. Um, so I really, I commend everyone, the, the staff here at NCPC, the community and the design team and the client. And on the community engagement side, I think what um, you've developed here will serve the, the campus well going into the future when it's up and operational, not just during the construction phase that to have the ICCB be a good neighbor, um, considering how tight you are you know, adjacent to these neighborhoods, is a really good way to begin that. And um, particularly, I'm pleased with the attention to open space and the setbacks of the fence and making it a very welcoming environment. And um, I just can't resist saying publicly how disappointed I was to see that one of your adjacent private neighbors was not nearly so sensitive to the trees. <laughs> Um, at that section that we saw that was really clear cut. Um, so I just wanted to, for the record, say I, I was a little surprised to see that. So, but thank you. There appear to have been 40 community meetings on this. So. Uh, we do have one person signed uh, up to speak, uh, Mr. Harold Fall, representing the Glen Echo Heights uh, ICCB committee, among others. Please join us, and you have up to five minutes. Welcome. Welcome back. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, come before you today. And uh, actually, I come on behalf of three colleagues and myself as individuals. 
um, Steve Salop, David Berg, Brad Northrup, and myself, Harry Full. Um, we've been before you on many times, many occasions with respect to this project, and uh, we've sort of been at the core of community engagement with DIA on the redesign of the ICCB since the inception of that process. And the comments that I have represent the consensus of the four of us. We unanimously endorse the Leo A. Daly facade and commend the leadership of the ICCB for the vast improvement over the original uh, plan. The current facade design complements the neighborhood, provides pleasing ambience for the academic campus and engages, uh, of an academic campus, and engages the wooded backdrop. And it's friendly. It, uh, you know, when the concept was presented to the collection of community leaders, um, originally, the, the reception was enthusiastic. Every, it was unanimously approved by everybody. Our one caveat, and this has been brought up in discussion here, uh, relates to the color at the back of Erskine Hall. And uh, it sits on the southwest portion of the site at the edge of the Palisades overlooking MacArthur Boulevard, as has been pointed out, Clara Barton Parkway in the Potomac. Big building, and the west side of it is, uh, was scheduled to be painted black, but I guess uh, charcoal or gray is under consideration at present. And um, we collectively, objected to the black, hoping to have something that would blend in with uh, the trees and, and be less obtrusive, perhaps some shade of gray, and yield to Leo A. Daly and the ICCB team's uh, outstanding design capabilities to come up with something that works well in that regard. That, that sort of a change would render the building less visible from MacArthur and Clara Barton Parkway in Virginia. And uh, you know, the team has advised us they'll get back to us and show us what they've got on that. Um, we've got, as has been mentioned, a March meeting, or uh, two March meetings on stormwater, and then a collective discussion of comments um, received from the stormwater and the facade and landscaping presentation. 15% landscaping design was uh, provided to us. And we're looking forward to meeting with the team again on that. Um, and we are likely to be coming back to you with, I, I presume, um, collective thoughts on that subject, and we really appreciate your, your involvement. Uh, it is a particular pleasure on behalf of both of, of Steve and David and uh, Brad and myself to be able to come here and instead of really providing uh, a heavy critique and seeking assistance, to say, hey guys, great job ICCB team. This is terrific. It's outstanding. And also to say to all of you, your commissioners, thank you so much for your support and help. Really appreciate it. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Fall, very much. Uh, we'll return this uh, to Commissioner. Are there any, is there any additional comment or questions? Just a couple of things. The visibility. We. Uh, I, I think that the one of the very positive aspects of the trip yesterday was to be able to stand in the garage and look down on MacArthur Boulevard and to see get a sense of what the visibility of the whole backside of the campus was. And we noticed that as vehicles passed on MacArthur, a split second. So unless unless you stop and get get rear-ended, it's it's very difficult to, to see any of the back of the campus from uh, from MacArthur. Uh, Commissioner May made a comment about uh, what a quality job the Corps of Engineers had done in being receptive to future projects. I think we can almost guarantee, and with a high level of confidence, that will happen because more than 40 percent of the projects over the federal capital improvement plan are DOD projects of which the Corps of Engineers will have a lion's share of presentation. So we look forward to quality presentations from them uh, in the future, and we're highly confident that that will occur. Indeed. Thank you very much. As you noted, there there are other uh, preliminary and final approvals for certain elements to, likely to come before us again, so we're not quite uh, done, but proceeding, proceeding nicely. Sensing no further discussion, um, is there a motion on the EDR? So moved. It's been moved and seconded that the preliminary and final approval of the building plans in this EDR um, be approved. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We're good. Thank you so much. We have two items left. Um, item number 5C is the screening and conference center additions at the William McChesney, building, uh, William McChesney Martin Jr. Building at the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve. And Mr. Detman is still with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
the uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System has submitted uh, for preliminary and final approval uh, the visitor screening and conference center addition project at the uh, William McChesney Martin Building. The Federal Reserve occupies a two-building complex in the area of Washington known as the Northwest Rectangle. You can see their two-building complex outlined in red here, uh, with some of the adjacencies being the National Mall directly to the south, uh, and some larger um, federal and, and quasi-federal um, headquarters buildings in, in close proximity, which we'll take a look at closer. The two buildings are separated by, uh, by C Street. Uh, here's a closer look with the Martin Building, which is the site of the proposed additions, uh, hatched in red there. And here you can see uh, the Southern Federal Reserve Building, the Eccles Building, fronting on Constitution Avenue. Uh, the site is generally bound by Virginia Avenue on the north, 21st Street on the west, and again C Street, um, separating the two Federal Reserve buildings uh, directly on the south. Uh, there are also two um, federal uh, reservations uh, adjacent to the building, uh, U.S. Reservation 105, which is on the north, and Reservation 378, uh, which is on the east. You can see the other headquarters buildings, large federal government office buildings in close proximity. Uh, just a quick note about the two reservations that are adjacent to the, the site. Uh, reservations 105 and 378 are National Park Service reservations. It's under their jurisdiction. However, um, for quite some time, the Federal Reserve, uh, through an agreement with the National Park Service, uh, actively maintains those properties and does a very good job of maintaining those properties. A little bit of background information on the Martin Building. The building was um, constructed in the 1970s, and it's an example of formalism, the, a modern architectural style known as formalism, which is characterized by um, uh, very strong horizontal projecting uh, roof lines, smooth wall surfaces, uh, uh, very strict geometry, and then oftentimes you'll see a building sitting atop um, structural columns um, at, at, the, at the base. Uh, so you can see with the, with the Martin building, you can see its strong roof line starting to form during construction. Uh, the cladding is, is marble, uh, smooth marble. You can see the overall symmetry of the building, and then at, at the ground floor level or, or the podium level, which I'll refer to, are these large uh, marble-clad uh, structural columns or pilotes. You can also see uh, in the photographs uh, the construction of the parking garage that's under the Martin Building. Uh, and concurrently with the construction of the building, there was also an underground parking garage placed below the uh, Federal Reservation to the north, which is shared by the Federal Reserve as well as the Department of Interior. So here's existing conditions with the Martin Building. Uh, you can see the reservation on the east with that has the large elliptical fountain uh, in it directly on the 20th Street axis. Uh, again, the, Mar uh, the Federal Reserve maintains uh, this fountain, uh, and during the uh, nicer weather, oftentimes you'll see it on. Uh, there is a staircase currently that leads from the podium level of the, of the Martin Building down into the reservation. Here's the reservation to the north. The entrances to the parking garages along 21st Street. There's another one off C Street. And then here on the south side of the Martin Building is the staircase leading up uh, to the podium level. There's some other existing conditions of the building. And then here's along C Street where you can see uh, the staircase leading up to the podium level into the recessed uh, ground floor glass enclosed level. There, on the sixth level, there's also a recessed sixth level uh, glass enclosed, which is um, oftentimes used for the board's conferences. Also in this photo, you can see the perimeter security. Uh, the permanent perimeter security that was approved by the commission uh, back in 2002, um, 2004. And then following construction of the permanent perimeter security, uh, the board turns its attention to um, remedying some of the deficiencies it had in visitor and employee screening as well as its conference center uh, space and capability uh, deficiencies. Uh, here are a couple photos at the top there you can see uh, the condition that you would find on a, a typical day uh, at the Martin Building. The Martin Building is the main entrance to the two-building complex. These two buildings are connected. Um, and so all the visitors and uh, employees going into the Federal Reserve are screened uh, sort of in a temporary facility currently in the podium level um, that has intermingling uh, visitors, employees, conference center um, attendees. Another deficiency they have is that because the conferences currently take place on the sixth floor, uh, the Martin Building doesn't have um, an adequate way to separate the employee floors with the conference center floors. And so uh, conference attendees on the sixth floor uh, constantly require an escort to move about the building. And so as part of this effort, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to completely renovate the podium level 
to move all the conference facilities down on the podium level and restrict access to the upper floors for the employees. And then you can see here the list of project objectives. Back in March 2010, the commission saw a concept uh, where it commented favorably on what was, the, what was proposed at the time and, um, and noted that the proposed additions were located entirely within the property lines and, and, and not located at all in public space with regard to the additions. It also required the applicant to reevaluate the location of the existing guard booth on 21st Street, uh, which is currently located in public space by permit uh, dating to about 2004. And then required the applicant, uh, or required the applicant that all the improvements located in public space, uh, water features, plantings, guard booths, uh, be consistent with local standards. The applicant has responded to these requirements, which I'll take you through momentarily. Again, just an illustration of the existing site plan uh, with the building uh, sitting on top its podium level and then here is what's being proposed now. What we're really looking at today is refinements and relatively minor refinements to the architecture of the proposed um, pavilions, the, the provision, pavilion additions and some refinements to the, the site plans but again it's it's relatively um, minor refinements. The, uh, the time period between 2010 concept and then the final con final submission today had everything to do with the board deciding to do a complete renovation of the interior of the building and so it required them to kind of rescope the project but uh, the, the, the four-year time uh, lapse didn't really have anything to do with uh, what we're looking at today and so what's proposed is a uh, screening facility along um, a large portion of the south facade of the Martin building which will uh, which will be uh, constructed out to the south property line uh, at grade with the sidewalk level. Um, that addition is approximately 10,000 square feet. And then two 5,000 square foot additions on the east and west terraces, which will be used again for, for conference uh, facilities. Uh, the three terraces, or the three additions have a green roof option uh, that the board is currently contemplating. Um, and then with regard to the site improvement plans, there are some uh, low plantings along C Street in order to soften the relationship between the sidewalk and the, the screening pavilion, uh, a new water feature along 21st Street, and then some other plantings around the building. Here is the uh, south elevation showing the existing on uh, the top and then the proposed on the bottom. Uh, the Focusing for a second on the screening pavilion, uh, the screening pavilion spans approximately eight bays. And, and a bay is made up of the space between the two, the two structural columns on the existing podium level. And so it spans a large portion, approximately 200 and 285 feet across the south facade. And you can see um, what's existing and proposed. Uh, I'll note what the refinements were between 2010 and today. And what it had to do with, largely driven by security requirements, is that the structural columns uh, that make up the proposed additions uh, got slightly larger. In, in size and footprint, uh, approximately by about four inches. So it's, it's relatively minor, but they did get a little bit more hefty. Uh, and then compared to what we saw at the concept stage, uh, the board has introduced a mullion system uh, for the glazing. Uh, previously, they were contemplating just a butt joint uh, with the two glasses coming together, uh, but security requirements required them to put in um, a, a mullion system. Here you can see the relationship of the South Pavilion to the existing Martin building. Uh, where it's relationship to the sidewalk. And so that grade differential that you see on the exterior stair is going to be accommodated inside the screening facility uh, through another stair and elevator bank that will bring you up that one level. Uh, and then the pavilion will be attached to the existing Martin building through a glass sloped uh, skylight, which you can see coming down here. And here you can get a better look at the structural columns, which the design of which have been influenced by the design of the existing structural columns. Um, and then you can see the mullion system on the glazing. Uh, here's a photo of an existing condition, and here's uh, what's proposed and its relationship to the pedestrian environment along C Street. Sure. Taking a closer look at the east and west pavilions, again, these are both for conference center um, functions. Uh, and so in total, with the renovation of the podium level, conference facility, conference area will be about 35,000 square feet. These two additions are 5,000 square feet uh, each. They're the same exact footprint, size, height, 
um, architectural character as the screening pavilion. Um, however, on the east side, um, what will be used is a vision glass system in order to allow views out to the gardens and the elliptical fountain. On the west side of the Martin Building, there's a need for a windowless space for a, like a theater or conference space or projection of uh, presentations. And so what's going to be used there is an obscured glass or a spandrel glass system that will retain the architectural character uh, but provide that um, or satisfy that, that programmatic requirement. Uh, and the two conference center additions are going to be attached to the existing Martin Building by uh, some um, darker uh, granite clad hyphen walls which will tuck underneath uh, the existing second floor or the, or the existing uh, soffit line of the building. You can see it here. Um, the material makeup of these hyphens was um, a, a, um, a focus of the Commission of Fine Arts uh, when it reviewed this project, uh, I think back in 2010, and delegated final approval to the staff, which occurred in December of last year. This is looking at the East Pavilion, and so you see existing and proposed, and on the bottom, this would be the side of the building where that elliptical fountain uh, you'd see. And on the west side, you can see... Um, uh, the other conference center edition, and you can see the changing grade uh, along 21st Street. <laughs> Site improvements, I mentioned that along C Street, uh, there's going to be, there is some plantings there now, it's going to stay there, some relatively low plantings, um, slightly raised planters, but um, uh, not too high. Uh, there's going to be a, a pedestrian egress path uh, ramp here, leading up to the podium level. There's a new water feature along 21st Street, that was part of the original concept, it's been uh, further along. The existing guard booth along 21st Street uh, is going to be slightly relocated to the north. It's located here now. It's about here. It's going to be slightly shifted north. There's an existing curb cut on 21st Street, which will be removed. The curb cut leads to a loading facility, kind of an elevator that allows you to offload a truck and bring it down to the garage level. Uh, the board does not use that anymore. They have a truck screening facility uh, in the street along 21st Street. Uh, that they use, and so they're going to close off that uh, curb cut, add an additional planter, and relocate that, that booth to the north. Here's just a, a quick look at the um, access ramp along C Street. And then here's an elevation and a closer look plan of the fountain along 21st Street. The fountain is designed to kind of follow the grade along 21st Street. Um, and if you're all familiar with the water feature at the World Bank, it kind of forms these parabolic water jets, uh, which you can see here. So just a couple of renderings before moving into staff analysis. Here's the proposed from 21st and C Street, and then a nighttime rendering. So with regard to the comprehensive plan, the project is consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan. It modernizes an existing federal facility. Uh, it does integrate security requirements within the existing confines of the property. Um, and in so doing, it avoids the adverse effects, uh, any adverse effects on the L'Enfant plan. Uh, just a quick note, during the concept stage, this building was found to be ineligible for historic designation. Um, and it was determined that there were no adverse effects on the L'Enfant plan by the D.C. SHPO uh, because it did not extend into public space, the additions. Uh, and then also, in general, it doesn't improve the quality of the surrounding public space. With regard to the Commission's Urban Design and Security Plan policies and, ob policies and objectives, um, as it did back at, at the concept stage, this project is uh, consistent with those, with those policies as well. And specifically, the, the project is consistent with the policy that, that states something to the effect of that pedestrian screening uh, security operations should not be conducted in public space. And if building additions are contemplated, uh, that those additions should be accommodated within the confines um, of the property. Um, the policies also call for the integration of security into new construction as well, which um, the, that has occurred in the conference center additions as well. I did want to make two comments about uh, security and screening operations, and, and specifically about the Commission's requirement to evaluate the relocation of that booth on 21st Street. Uh, the applicant's response to that requirement was that uh, moving the security kiosk uh, to the east to within the property of the board uh, it's not an option, as security sight lines along 21st Street would be compromised, um, blocked by both landscaping, the water feature, as well as the conference center addition. Uh, we certainly understand that. 
uh, and we understand that it is an existing booth there by permit uh, that's in line with an existing perimeter wall. Uh, however, uh, staff has been working very closely with D DDOT and DCOP as well as the State Department and the board uh, to really clean up 21st Street, the condition of 21st Street. There's a lot of temporary perimeter security out there for the State Department. Uh, we've been working for some time with them on cleaning that up. There's a truck check facility, there's a guard booth, and so we really want to, the focus is to reclaim the character of 21st Street uh, as a typical DC L'Enfant Street. And so we think any little, every little bit helps. Uh, and so uh, at a recent consultation meeting with DCOP and DDOT, there was a request that the board evaluate um, maybe shifting the guard booth partially onto their property uh, in order to um, limit the projection in the public space by no more than four feet. This would be consistent with local uh, public space standards. Um, we also see a, a potential for a small conflict in pedestrian circulation in the current location of the booth being located directly in line with that with pedestrians walking up and down 21st Street and that door uh, opening up into the sidewalk, which is inconsistent with local standards as well, uh, there's a slight conflict. And so we, we think that there's an opportunity here uh, for a solution that balances the interests uh, to look at some sort of slight shifting out of public space in order to avoid that pedestrian conflict and become more in conformance with the public space standards. And so as you'll see, staff is recommending that the commission support the district government's recent request to continue to evaluate this. Um, another reason why we should, even though it's a, a small shift we're talking about, we want to pay attention to that guard booth along 21st Street because the Monumental Core Framework Plan specifically identified um, a need to, uh, to implement strategies for improving pedestrian circulation between the mall and up into the northwest rectangle along 20th and 21st Street, uh, as you can see here. Here's some existing conditions along 21st Street. You can see the temporary perimeter security. You can see the, the truck check facility, the guard booth. Um, and so again, um, any little bit helps, we think, and um, if there's a way that we can uh, address the guard booth in a, in a manner that addresses, that balances the interests, uh, we think that's worth looking at. And so with that, um, it's the executive director's recommendation to approve the preliminary and final site and building plans for the project, to support the District of Columbia government's recent request for the relocation of the existing guard booth along 21st Street to reduce its projection into public space, and then finally to note that any improvements located in public space will require public space permitting uh, through the D.C. Department of Transportation Office of Public Space Management. That concludes my presentation. Can you any questions? Thank you, and Mr. And the applicant is here much. to uh, address any questions. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Commission members, discussion? Ms. Stungasser. Thank you very much, Mr. Detman, and I appreciate the recognition of the public space concerns that the city has. I think the architectural additions are, are are, are really nice. I've always liked this building, and I think they've done a nice job in proposing their additions. The the fountain along 21st Street, which, how high is that? That it is a visibility issue. Wasn't it? Um, not not including the little water jets. Without the jets, uh, I would say yeah. that uh, the wall the wall uh, follows the grade of the street, mm -hmm. uh, and so typically it's it, it generally is maintained to a regular seat wall height. So it's never more than 42 inches, say. Okay. So it, it, it really shouldn't be a visibility problem for anybody to see over it from a security standpoint. I'd say from the elevation of the sidewalk to maybe these steps where the, the water feature is, maybe mm -hmm. that might pre exceed 42 inches, but the wall along the, the edge of the sidewalk is typical okay. seat wall height. All right, thank you. I have another questions. Thank you. Others? Mr. Provencher. A couple of questions. Um, some of the positive aspects of the project include uh, pushing security, obviously, outside the building, along the, the south side of the Martin Building, which is uh, clearly a, a good thing, accommodating the changes of elevation within that building. That new uh, structure make, makes a lot of sense. The uh, pushing the conference facilities down from the upper floors <coughs> to the east and west ends of the building, I think, is another uh, positive feature. The, the standard uh, concerns that we have about uh, exterior water features are um, you create, uh, of course, uh, bathing areas for homeless folks. There's a, ch a concern about uh, water features above either occupied spaces or, for example, does the garage extend uh, underneath what would be this new, new water feature? 
we, we find that water is very in, insidious and it will find find a way. Are there, it was talked about in general there's some improvements uh, envisioned along 21st Street. Are there other buildings that have water features along 21st Street in this neighborhood? So this would be a, a welcome addition. Uh, between the mall work. and Virginia Avenue, this would be the first water feature. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I kind of knew the answer to that question. Uh, the Pelotis seem to be, I, I can't really tell from the exterior renderings, are, do the Pelotis taper down? There was a comment made that the uh, exterior columns of the security pavilion on the south side of the building are influenced by the Pelotis, but I couldn't tell whether the Pelotis taper and therefore the, the uh, mm -hmm. structural columns will also taper. Is, it, is that accurate? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's a, even more than, a, I think, a influence. I think that's a direct correlation. Did I read someplace, though, that the glazing on the pavilions are different? The East Pavilion has a vision type of a glass exterior, and the screening and the West Pavilion have obscured glass. I didn't understand the, the justification or the rationale to have what would appear to be different types of exterior. It's a programmatic glass. need. Um, the East Pavilion will be a multi-purpose room, meeting room that have windows that look out onto the surrounding landscape. Right. The West Pavilion will be used for... Um, it's, it, there's a need for a windowless space in order to project movies or slideshows or a theater. Okay. Uh, so. so it's driven by the interior. Mm -hmm. the, the, the conferencing, it was talked about part of the ge uh, genesis for the project was to move the conferencing from upper levels to provide greater security. Does it ha provide uh, comparable conferencing space? For example, are there are 250 seats upstairs, and now in the East and West Pavilions, there'll be 250 seat conferencing capacity. Is that, is that at all? I don't know the exact number, is my understanding. So that sixth floor is, is their cafeteria, and that's what they use right. for big meetings or conferences. And so it's inadequate in space and it's inadequate <coughs> in audiovisual okay. capabilities as well. Uh, so considering that if the footprint is 35,000 square feet, that's what they're working with up top. Uh -huh. And now they're going um, to, or 25,000 square feet, now they'll be taking up the entire ground floor of the building plus an additional 10,000 square feet. Oh, okay. So the entire ground floor would be conferencing as opposed to just the new pavilions. Got it. Okay. Ca uh, cafeteria stays upstairs? I believe so. And it, it expands in place? Renovated? Okay. Gotcha. Thank you for those clarifications. Appreciate that. That's all I have. Mr. May. So uh, it's been a while since we reviewed this project, so my memory on it is a bit vague. I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but the, um, the, the building was determined to not be eligible for the National Register. Do you know reason why that was? Um, not specifically. I know that they applied the four, the four criteria, um, which it had integrity issues. Uh, it, was, it was determined to have integrity issues under those four criteria. It's also not old enough, and so the criteria for buildings less than 50 years old was also applied. I see. Okay. Because it's, it, it's got more going for it uh, <laughs> when it comes to the modern buildings that we have in Washington, so I'm just so surprised to see that it was not listed. So, um, well, maybe with a little time, that will get revisited and it will get changed, and, uh, and, and in future years, they'll they'll take off the security things just like we were going to do at the Washington Monument. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I think what's been done here is, is fine and um, for what it is, but I wish it didn't have to be done. I kind of like the building the way it was. But that's all. Is that a prelude to a <laughs> comment? Oh, was that, that, that goes in the record as audible sigh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think um, it's just kind of scandalous, right, when we look at the uneven application of the criteria in this city. Wow. This is a really nice mid-century modern building, and all of its legible, you know, typological uh, characteristics that we associate with this particular genre will now disappear, um, which is not a criticism of the design solution, um, but but uh, um, just how sad that we take one of the mid-century modern buildings we have that, that we wouldn't like to take a stick of dynamite to, and instead we kind of, you know, commit design murder. You know, it's just a shame. Um, 
again, uh, it's it's as good a solution, I suppose, as you're going to come up with, and sensitive to the to what makes this uh, a palatable mid-century modern building, or actually a nice one. Um, uh, uh, can't the Fed come up with some money to put it under the ground? Would be my <laughs> rhetorical question. Um, so, um, but but specifically, assuming that 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 everything has to be <clears throat> above the ground. The only thing that I would say, can we can we have a um, the picture of the um, the corn? There's a perspective rendering of the corner. I think the um, yeah, there. perfect. Um, you know, I get that you have the, a grade change that's difficult to. Um, Accommodate, but but I <clears throat> I would urge a little bit more explore, exploration about around the this this particular well both corners, but since we have this one, uh, it just feels still um, <coughs> a little junked up um, in plan. It reads fine, but if you if you're if you're approaching this street corner, the the legibility problems that I already mentioned are seem acute to me. I, I at this particular um, point of arrival, um, it's it's hard to know what to do if you're approaching the building from from here, and I'm and I'm not sure what the solution is. Um, I just want to mark the problem. Uh, I wouldn't know what to do or where to go if I was somebody who was already kind of nervous about going to the Fed and going into a conference, and it just doesn't. Maybe there's a wayfinding solution that that would help. Just there's a lot a a, a lot going on here um, that I think a, 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 a little simplicity would would serve the design well here. Uh, yeah. So I'll conclude with another audible sigh. <laughs> Mr. Miller. Yeah, um, I appreciate the uh, the efforts to try to improve the uh, the streetscape along C and Twenty First Streets. What is the status of the um, the temporary? What is the status of the security that's in the that's in the middle of those streets currently? Did we approve that? I I, I don't know whether or not um, that temporary uh, security came before the commission. We can take a look, and I'll get back to you. Um, the status of the State Department's perimeter security project next month. You're going to see partial perimeter security for the AFA building, uh, which relates directly to the Harry Truman Building perimeter security, which you should be seeing sometime this year. We're very close, um, working out some details on the location of the truck check facility and the phasing of the project, but you should see it uh, this year. And um, it, you may recall that the Diplomacy Center, which has already been approved by the Commission, is also going to be constructed along 21st Street as well. And, and these streets have been closed. Are they closed to vehicular traffic? No, 21st Street is two lanes in southbound. Uh, between C and Virginia. C Street is closed to traffic. D yeah. e Street's probably been closed for quite some time. Uh, doesn't even really exist. And then, yeah. And is there ever any uh, effort or vision of reclaiming C Street as a, as a functioning street? Um, likely not. There's, um, I don't remember when this was put into place, but um, in our consultation with the Department of State, uh, there was an agreement struck between the Department of State and the district government, the city administrator, uh, regarding this perimeter security project and a relationship to the Walter Reed effort. Um, that agreement uh, keeps C Street closed, uh, and it, it, it specifies how many lanes of traffic along 23rd Street, and there's a couple things about 21st Street as well. Thank you. So 21st Street is open right there. Audible side. <laughs> okay, any additional discussion among... Yes, sir. Please. Good afternoon. I'm Enrique Bellini, principal of KCCT. Uh, just a clarification, C Street is open right now in front of the two buildings of the Federal Reserve. It is 
on the Department of State side it's closed that, you, the, that, that, yeah. that it is closed. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Quick question to, for clarification. Does the note about improvements uh, located in public space, is that what is that broad enough to cover the guard booth issue? Is that is that what th that's intended to to, to cover? Um, it, it relates to the relocation of the guard booth as well as the new water feature, new plantings, anything in public space, any construction in public space. So is it, it, it's broad enough, it's, it's a bit vague. Does it need to be clarified to include the water feature in the guard booth and s s examples of the things that are currently in, envisioned to go into public space? Or is, or is this... It's a statement that we've used. Deliberately broad enough so it would apply there. It's a statement we've used in other projects, uh, just generally to note that improvements to public space, because it's under the jurisdiction of the city, is subject to that permitting process. Ms. Steingasser. What, what happens, does the project return to NCPC if they do not get approval from the Public Space Committee for these improvements? So what would happen in that situation is if they don't get approval, there would be a change to the plan, presumably. Um, the applicant would inform staff of what changes were made, uh, and in accordance with our guidelines, we would make a determination whether or not they're substantial and require further review by the commission. Okay. Thank you. I, I have one question, Ms. I can't figure it out. Sorry. What's the distance, what, what's the width of the sidewalk at the, at the, you know, in the middle of C Street? I mean, after you add the, the new construction, what's left of the sidewalk? I can't tell. I can get back to you on specific numbers. About. My understanding is that it's a typical DC sidewalk, which is a minimum of 10 feet. Okay. From curb to face, from curb to property line. Okay. Is there a motion on the EDR that's before us? So moved. It's been moved and seconded that the EDR for the preliminary and final approval of the site and building plans be approved. All in favor say aye. Opposed no. Pass unanimously. The last item on the agenda, <clears throat> with enthusiasm, the last item on the agenda is item number 6A. It's an information presentation for the Council of Governments recently approved the Place and Opportunities Report and the Regional Transportation Priorities Plan. Ms. Coster. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman and members of the Commission, uh, you've had the opportunity today to look at three um, very exciting and specific projects, and now uh, we're going to, I guess, stretch out a little bit and look uh, regionally. So uh, I'm very excited today uh, to be introducing uh, two representatives from the Metro Washington Council of Governments. Uh, you might recollect that the uh, Commission had previously looked at Region Forward which was the effort of COG and the region's jurisdictions uh, to put forth both a vision and aspirations for how we would accommodate uh, future regional growth. Uh, uh, both the Council of Governments uh, Board and the Transportation Planning Board have recently adopted uh, two plans that further that region forward vision. So John Swanson, uh, who is the senior transportation planner, uh, will first provide an overview of the Regional Transportation Priorities Plan. Uh, this is an important guide to where the region's jurisdictions intend to invest their transportation resources and offers a way uh, to think regionally and act locally. Following John, uh, Sophie Mintier, a regional planner uh, with COG, will present the Place Plus Opportunities Report. This is a regional framework to understand common challenges and opportunities among activity centers in our region. And you might recall that activity centers reflect where all of the region's jurisdictions have collectively planned to accommodate future employment and residential growth. Um, today's presentations are really intended to share what's going on uh, with both our uh, friends at COG and uh, the jurisdictions that they work with. Um, I think it's also a great opportunity uh, for us. Uh, many of the activity centers include federal properties. So from these documents, I think there are opportunities for NCPC and other federal agencies to use the very um, thorough and thoughtful information in these reports uh, to better understand uh, community development opportunities, 
uh, and urban design and placemaking uh, uh, strategies at specific locations. So with that, um, I'll let John take it away. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks Watson. Welcome. Uh, first, let me say condolences on the loss of Mr. Kirby, and we note that the, this report is dedicated to him. He was a terrific person. Thank you, and that's a that's an important note to start on because this 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 um, plan really is mm -hmm. is a, a legacy to Ron Kirby. Um, he was behind this um, all along the way, and um, this is something that you know we were able to. It was it was pretty far along when he when he when he died, and. Um, we were able to wrap it up and get this approved by the by the board in in January. So um, thanks for that that introduction. Um, so I, I I am with the Cog staff, but I work with the Transportation Planning Board, which is the designated metropolitan planning organization for the Washington region. We um, you know most of our work really focuses on meeting federal requirements. Um, developing um, a long-range transportation plan every year that is constrained and actually reflects sort of what the region thinks it can fund over the next 30 years. Also, um, um, a lot of our work goes into ensuring that the region's transportation plan uh, meets federal requirements for air quality improvement. Um, but uh, several years ago, and this was really actually driven by our Citizens Advisory Committee, um, there was a call for us to um, identify regional priorities through a, a planning process um, for transportation. And um, we embarked upon this process about three years ago. And um, it really, as I mentioned to you um, already, that this is a, um, something that Ron Kirby worked on. Um, it's a legacy to him. It's also, I think, though, a legacy to, to the region. This is something that really um, takes advantage. It calls upon the region to take advantage of our existing assets, um, building upon past successes and really being practical about the, the future that we chart for ourselves. So um, I'm going to talk about the Transportation Priorities Plan. Sophie's going to tell you a bit about um, the Place Plus Opportunity Plan. I think there's a lot of overlap between the two, and the common thread really is um, activity centers. Um, the, the, um, the idea that on a regional level, um, as well as on a local and state level, we need to bring together land use and transportation. Um, this is not working. Power. power. Is there a power stream? <laughs> Maybe now. Should I just go over there, maybe? This is probably something really obvious. Oh, thank you. So the, the um, priorities plan is um, something that was designed to respond to our most significant transportation challenges, identifying strategies that have the greatest potential for doing that. Um, Ron Kirby was really very focused on the idea that he wanted this to include strategies that the region could get behind. And therefore, we put a lot of focus on, um, on um, public opinion survey. Um, really, r this to a large degree um, reflects um, sort of a, a customer sort of or, or a, a consumer sort of focus and um, sort of a spoiler alert really the, the number one priority that folks identified was that we need to take care of the existing system. Um, may sound a little bit boring but that is really sort of the commonsensical approach that citizens in this region really sort of have rallied behind. Um, this is a plan that is rooted in a lot of past work that we've done, scenario analysis, but also policy planning, including um, a focus on activity centers, which I'm going to talk about um, and Sophie's going to talk even more about. It is a policy plan. This is something that is not, um, does not identify specific projects. That may be something we do in the future, but it is, um, it is something that's not necessarily measurable. It is, a, it is a plan that has strategies at a relatively high level. The um, strategies themselves, the plan was um, um, based upon um, the survey that I already mentioned, stakeholder feedback um, through a variety of our, our members, TPB, um, Julia Coster, at very active in, with our organization through um, representing NCPC, but uh, all the states and um, local jurisdictions in our region as well. So the priorities are really intended to be within reach financially, politically. This is a pragmatic um, plan. Um, they're intended to achieve greater efficiency by making better use of our existing infrastructure 
and they're designed to encourage area leaders to consider regional needs when developing projects. One of the um, criticisms that we actually got in the final stages of this is that it's not visionary a lot enough. In fact, our response has been that the power of this plan is really that it, it recognizes um, pragmatic realities, um, that recognizes really a fact that the, the, the new bold for this era is is, is got to be pragmatism. We need to think about the region differently than we did in the past. We need to be smart about the decisions we make. Um, and among those um, key decisions that we need to make are how to best use activity centers. Um, and um, bottom line, we need to make sure that we take care of the system that's already in place. That's job one, and if there's any call for action here, that's it. The priorities were articulated in the plan in this building block approach, essentially um, expressing the fact that if we're going to achieve our regional vision, we've got to take care of the existing system. We've got to make sure that um, good systems are in, already in place. And so, as if I haven't already said this enough, priority one is that we need to meet our existing obligations. Um, this building block is really key. Um, you know, at best, our roads and our transit systems symbolize our region's vibrancy, um, the best things we have to offer. But at its worst, when metro and our roads are in a state of disrepair, it really causes us to question our, our very ability to take care of, of our own basic needs and to function in the future. And um, we had, in the past, experienced a backlog of, of um, deferred maintenance on, on metro. Hopefully, we've got a handle on that, but we need to make sure that we stay ahead of that curve. Priority two really um, is, a, is a range of sort of process improvements that we need to make to strengthen public confidence and ensure fairness. I mean, it really gets to questions of accountability, efficiency, and accessibility for traditionally disadvantaged populations. You know, these are really across the board good ways of doing business. So again, we're essentially talking about public confidence here. Our public opinion research found that 45% of participants said they were not confident that the region's transportation agencies would make good use of the resources available to them. So we need to establish systems to demonstrate that the public agencies who plan, build, and run our transportation systems know what they're doing, they're open and transparent, and the needs of vulnerable and disadvantaged populations are taken into account throughout the entire process. Um, priority three is the, are, the, are the actions that most of us are mo most familiar with would be most typically in a plan like this. They include a variety of supply and demand strategies, um, multimodalism, focus on in, providing a variety of transportation choices, and um, again, focusing on regional activity centers, largely because this is an efficient way for us to move people and goods. So what are some of the key elements of this priority? Um, they really start with core capacity. You know, we're planning $7 billion currently um, in transit improvements throughout the region. That's the Silver Line, the Purple Line. Um, but really, all those improvements um, are meaningless if we don't make sure we take care of core capacity needs. Uh, Metro's momentum plan, the 2025 component, identifies $6.5 billion in improvements. And that really is essential for us to, to um, it's essential for us to meet those um, needs and obligations if the entire system is going to work effectively. That includes eight car trains, it includes core capacity improvements, it includes the priority corridor network for Metro bus and a variety of other key core capacity improvements. This, um, this priority also includes a variety of things that are needed to make um, rail, including commuter rail, um, function. Uh, in the core, that includes the Long Bridge project and Union Station improvements. And finally, we need to make sure that um, our roads are kept in a state of, of good repair as well. We've, we've taken major steps to address that backlog. We've got good news with new funding in Maryland and Virginia, but um, we need to make sure we stay ahead of the curve. Um, concentrated growth in activity centers. This is, um, I think, sort of um, a realization of the fact that good land use planning is an effective transportation strategy. Um, if we concentrate growth in activity centers, this is something that we've known and been talking about for a couple decades. We can really um, make most effective use of the existing transportation system. That means making sure that um, activity centers have a job housing balance, 
um, that we focus on opportunities on the eastern side of the region, and making sure that activity centers really are tailored um, to each jurisdiction's needs. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And in fact, I think a major success at COG has been the fact that we've gotten the outer jurisdictions of our region, um, Manassas, Frederick, uh, Loudoun, to really embrace this idea and understand that activity centers are meaningful for them. So the transportation side of this is obviously we got to make sure that um, we don't just provide connections between activity centers, but within activity centers. Um, this is a great way to provide modal choice. Distances are short, but we need to make sure that you know, people don't need to drive um, distances of you know, half a mile, that bike, biking, walking, um, um, circulator buses are available to them. Um, we did understand, and this is something that we, we grappled with a lot, that the region does need more surface transit. Um, we recognize that we're sort of past the, um, the um, phase of heavy rail building the WMATA system out. Um, so we really did concentrate a lot in this report on bus rapid transit. This is something that is, is um, being planned and discussed and will be happening in a variety of places around the region. As a region, we need to think how to connect these different systems and make sure that we're, we're, we're thinking about them holistically. In some places, though, we know that street level rail is going to be a, an important option. Um, rail provides opportunities for economic development and fast, efficient service, and we know that that's going to be an important part of our future as well. And finally, express toll lanes, um, something that economists have agreed upon for a long time. The technology is finally in place where it can happen, but the real question is, are the politics in place to allow it to happen? I think the answer is sort of a cautious yes. We're seeing it. Um, we've got a number of new projects that have come online, hot lanes, the ICC. Um, but I think that the, um, the sort of the new frontier is going to be, um, will the public um, endorse the idea of, of um, pricing existing capacity? And that's going to be a real challenge. I don't know if you've had um, any presentations or experience with Move DC, but the, the new um, long-range transportation plan for DC is going to be looking at some really bold options for pricing, and as well as a cordon charge, a, a priced zone. So express tolling can really um, do two things. It can manage congestion, raise revenue, um, and, and we understand that uh, from a regional perspective, the idea here is to provide choice and increase benefits. We did a major study with a public opinion um, study with Brookings last year and really found that, that folks are feeling a sort of a lack of control in their lives. If they think pricing is going to overcomplicate um, their, their lives, um, they're not for it. But if we can provide benefits and options to them, um, there's a possibility that this is something they could embrace. So next steps, um, we're conducting outreach, sort of just in the initial stages of that. Um, we're doing an evaluation of our long-range plan, the constrained long-range plan, in comparison with the priorities plan that will be prepared for our board next month, um, identifying specific projects that are being put forward by our members that are consistent with this plan, and finally seeking opportunities to really combine this message with place plus opportunity, um, emphasizing the fact that activity centers and connections between and within activity centers are really an important part of our transportation future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sophie. Good afternoon. So as John discussed, um, the RTPP includes strategies uh, for making better connections, stronger transportation connections between and within activity centers Place plus opportunity, which I'm going to be discussing, uh, focuses on uh, strategies to make those centers more uh, successful, more distinct, and thriving places, um, which in turn will better support the transportation network. Um, so there's really great synergy between these two reports. We see them in, as complementary. And beyond the connections that have already been mentioned, um, they both provide ways um, for member, our members and other stakeholders to think regionally and act locally. So this report, Place and Opportunity, comes out of a long line of COG work on activity centers dating back to the TPB vision of 1998, moving through the re region forward, our regional vision, and uh, most recently the 2013 new activity center map. 
this report is a resource to support local uh, decision making on planning and investment in activity centers and to support our members activities to create thriving and high opportunity places in these centers. The report identifies similar challenges, similar needs among centers, looks at connections uh, between them and provides goals, tools, and strategies for addressing um, these needs and helping communities to, very different types of communities to meet their aspirations. In creating these, this report, we um, not only wanted to provide analysis and assistance to our member jurisdictions, uh, but also to provide a regional perspective for understanding the way that our broad network of activity centers works together and understanding the common challenges that face activity centers and most importantly sharing solutions. Um, so a brief recap on activity centers. There are 141 of uh, 141 centers that are on the latest COG map that was adopted a year ago by the COG board. These represent the places that are going to accommodate a majority of growth uh, in the future, about 60% of new households and about 75% of new jobs through 2040. They're consistent with local planning. We worked very closely in, in designating these centers with the planning departments of every local jurisdiction to make sure that these, uh, the most important places from their perspective were included on this map. And for the most part, they are small, focused areas with a mix of uses. They're not just major employment centers as they had been in the past, but they're areas that integrate, um, that currently have or are planned to have a mix of housing, uh, jobs, services, and other amenities. And very importantly, they are well aligned with the existing and planned transportation network. So in this report, we studied about two-thirds of the uh, 141 activity centers. And we um, grouped every activity center um, according to place type and opportunity type. From there, we identified development goals to respond to the needs of each type and a set of strategies and tools to help implement those development goals. So it's important to note that the recommendations in this report are at the level of place types and opportunity types, not made for individual activity centers. This report is largely about placemaking. Uh, we were very interested in uh, the characteristics and features that make for a distinct and high quality place, whether that's in a very urban area or an emerging suburban area or a traditional town. Um, and so we studied at, at every one of these activity centers uh, from the street level doing these detailed urban form surveys. We also looked at market characteristics of all the activity centers. Based on that, we identified these six different place types, ranging from urban centers like downtown DC, suburban multi-use centers like Falls Church, to satellite cities such as downtown Frederick. We were also very interested in looking at the human side of activity centers, so uh, characteristics that make um, these places inclusive and high opportunity places to live and work. So we studied a range of indicators that included job access by transit, housing affordability, uh, income diversity, and the concentration of low income households. Based on that analysis, for each of the activity centers, we identified four opportunity types. So they are transforming centers, transitioning, connected core, and stable centers. And as I mentioned, uh, for each of those types, we then uh, identified development goals and strategies and tools. So to walk through some of those, I'm going to talk about two example activity centers that also include federal facilities. First, St. Elizabeth's, which also um, is one of the uh, case studies that we include in this report. So St. Elizabeth's um, is classified as a revitalizing urban center. Re revitalizing urban centers are uh, places that are, have fundamentally urban character that have more limited recent development and may have barriers such as urban form or public safety to additional development. The goals that are identified for these types of centers um, are are things that you can see are already underway for the most part in St. Elizabeth's incentivizing development, identifying catalytic sites, 
creating a framework for redevelopment, so things like the, the consolidation of DHS and the um, Gateway Pavilion on East Campus, as well as the master plans for both campuses. Those are examples uh, uh, in line with these development goals. The place type for St. Elizabeth, or the opportunity type, uh, is identified as a transforming center. Transforming centers are places that tend to have very high concentrations of low-income households, high income diversity, high housing affordability, and also high job access by transit. And these places um, are poised for significant change with major redevelopment or with major transit investment. And so the goal, development goal identified for this type of center is stabilize and preserve. So this has to do with putting in place proactive strategies that can help prepare for, um, prepare the community and safeguard um, affordability and stability for the long term. Some examples of the strategies and tools that correspond to those goals. Development incentives, um, following from the uh, master plans, um, next steps might be development incentives and public finance options um, to spur additional private development. And on the opportunity side, since um, the surrounding area has a large concentration of both subsidized housing and market rate affordable housing, affordable housing preservation is a very uh, uh, key priority for this area. And so there's some strategies and tools related to that. In addition to that, um, one of the strategies recommended is um, business retention and promotion to help strengthen the local retail districts to support local businesses and local workers to ensure that they um, can benefit from the redevelopment. The sec second example I'm going to discuss is Beauregard. There we go. Okay, so Beauregard is classified in our report as a suburban multi-use center. Um, these are places that are um, mid, um, excuse me, um, tend to be moderate rent, um, established suburban locations um, that have a mix of uses, but it's a horizontal mix of uses rather than Could a we mix stop of for uses. One second, sure. I don't know where Beauregard is. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's located in Alexandria. Okay. Yes. Near 395. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, so it's a suburban multi-use center. Um, the goals that are identified for these types of places are to add parks and public space, which is actually a main focus of the um, small area plan um, that was recently adopted for Beauregard, to encourage an additional mix of uses. Um, so looking at where the gaps, where the gaps are, um, and then coming up with um, ideas of ways to fill those gaps and adding pedestrian features to make it a more walkable community. Things like sidewalks, street lighting, uh, pedestrian, other pedestrian features. The opportunity type for Beauregard is a stable center. Um, it has moderate income diversity, moderate housing affordability. It has low job access by transit. The goal identified here for these types of centers is to leverage existing assets. In this case, um, it's uh, the location of the Mark Center, a lar large concentration of federal jobs. There's also a wide range of different types of housing stock in the area. And looking at some of the strategies and tools that go along with those development goals, uh, again, some of these are already underway. So play strategies include um, zoning interventions like uh, design guidelines, increased density, public finance options, and development incentives such as density bonuses or TDRs. On the opportunity side, um, strategies might include commercial and job diversification. So looking at ways um, to fill gaps. Um, this, is, this area is dominated by, um, in terms of the office that's there, is dominated by these federal jobs. And so what are additional um, commercial retail services that could be brought into this area? And um, uh, what are incentives that could help achieve that? Um, we're also looking at um, transportation access and infrastructure improvements. 
um, ways to make this a more accessible community by um, identifying any barriers, last mile barriers, um, and improving street lighting. As I mentioned, looking at sidewalk enhancements or buffers, et cetera. So these are two examples that highlight the types of information and the types of resources that are in this report. Again, we studied um, two-thirds of the activity centers, so we studied 92 different centers in the report. Moving on to next steps um, in terms of the way COG is um, going to be carrying out this work in the future. A couple of things that are underway are planned. First of all, we are partnering with ULI Washington um, to select and help to fund three technical assistance panels per year for the next three years. If you're not familiar with the ULI TAP program, um, it brings together teams of experts in different disciplines to intensively focus on a location or a project and then provide uh, very tailored recommendations. Um, so we're going to be selecting uh, a range of projects um, that are in activity centers that represent a range of different place types and opportunity types over the next three years. And this is a way to provide resources and provide technical assistance to our members. We're also talking with our colleagues in TPB about ways to better align some of the existing programs that we have at COG um, together. And so a couple of examples of how we're uh, interested in doing this are looking at the Transportation Alternatives Program, potentially using uh, place and opportunity as a decision-making lens there, or using uh, this report to inform the project selection and the peer exchange network. Uh, for the TPP's Transportation and Land Use Connections program. In addition to that, we did a lot of very detailed urban form analysis in particular through this report. And so we're um, going to be working on toolkits to help um, show our member jurisdictions how they can use this very detailed analysis and apply it to their activity centers that we're studying. So again, in closing, um, these reports, I think, together focus on uh, providing ways to help create a more effective and integrated transportation system and to make sure that the activity centers that the transportation system connects are as successful and as dynamic as they can be. So as we move forward, we're continually seeking ways that we can better, better integrate our work and to integrate work with other partners around the region. Thank you. I have a quick question. I realize this is <clears throat> a planning document, um, but I'm wondering the extent to which economic development experts and such were at the table and what, I know you had a developer's focus group, but mm -hmm. when I look at your list of um, local officials who are at the table, I see only two, one from Bowie City and one from Frederick, who were kind of from economic development perspective. Mm -hmm. To what extent was there kind of an inclusion of commercial side, economic development sure. that goes into this transportation and land use planning document? Um, I would say that um, the, the main audience for this report was um, local governments and the um, cohort we worked most closely with was on the planning side. Um, so that certainly influences the types of recommendations that are in this report. However, one of the project partners on the report was RCL Co. Yeah, right. Um, and so they really came up with um, the types of recommendations that you see for the place, the place types. And I would say that the, the feedback we got from that developer focus group um, really informed sort of the direction we took. Mr. Hart. Um, I recognize that you're constrained in that you're operating within a set of regional jurisdictions uh, that are members. Mm -hmm. But when I think of regional transportation and development, Baltimore and the corridor that connects Baltimore, Washington, and even Richmond seems to me to be, you know, a very high, I don't know, intensity corridor. Mm -hmm. and, and to ignore that, I think, is is something that you know is, is a problem even if it's only to say that you know outside of this colored area there are also these other important transportation linkages and development areas um, and if you're really talking about region it it goes beyond just the boundaries that you've drawn here and and I would encourage you to, to reach out to 
you know, the Baltimore area or the Richmond area and look at that I-95 corridor with trains and highways and a lot of development that's not residential, that's industrial and, mm -hmm. and commercial because that drives a lot of the transportation requirements. Um, I would say that um, I'm not a transportation planner, but we do work with our um, uh, colleagues up in the, the Baltimore COG, BMC, um, on certain transportation activities. We also have involvement of the state DOTs. Yeah, um, I mean, transportation and land use are inextricably linked. Right. I mean, you, you can't have one without the other. And without that kind of coordination, uh, one's going to suffer and the other's going to suffer as, as a consequence. So. At least acknowledging these other coordinating uh, opportunities, I think, is important to show that you really are reaching out, and it's not just looking at the the piece that within the window. That's absolutely right, um, and that actually may be something we would want to take up in future <coughs> rounds of this because I, that's that's a comment that we hear. I would say that we, in finalizing this plan, we did get a lot of feedback from um, advocates for commuter rail. So um, the sort of the Baltimore question is really. Um, is, is very acute there, and um, some a lot of the core capacity needs that I highlighted earlier really are essential if um, if that commuter rail line um, from Baltimore is going to be as effective as it can be. So that's something I think from our sort of standard planning practice, we do um, model uh, the a wider region than just Washington because we we are required to look at um, trips overall in this region. Um, so we are very much aware of what's going on in Baltimore. We have a lot of um, coordination with, with Maryland, um, but for the purpose of priority planning, I think maybe that is something we'd want to emphasize more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some of us remember when there was no Beltway and no Metro and no Home Rule. So. We've made a lot of progress, uh, despite uh, a lot of problems, even at times of uh, divided government. So I would just encourage you to continue, and, and really for all of us to continue. It's, it's been my experience that if you challenge people from a regional perspective uh, and, and show them how it is in their interest to think regionally uh, and to uh, be persistent about it, uh, that uh, you can make progress, and uh, indeed, you look at the disputes we have today, they're nothing like the disputes you had over the Beltway. Where should the metro stations be, and how much parking, and should there be park, so on and so forth. So taking the long view, I think that uh, we've had uh, tremendous progress in this region, and uh, because of organizations such as ours and yours and others, I think that uh, uh, we can continue to do so, but it, it's not automatic. Thank you. Mr. Provencia. Mm -hmm. Echo the uh, comments of Commissioner Hart and uh, Commissioner uh, Dennis about uh, ex expanding the, the planning. I'll give an example. We visited a few years ago with the folks at Carroll County, and uh, we were very impressed at how broad their planning was. They described the Golden Crescent from Baltimore clear down to Richmond and how integrated and uh, collaborative the, plan the transportation planning was. I think it also reinforces and, and helps to justify why we have transportation planning as elements in the comprehensive plan, the importance to, to keep those up to date and, and expand. Mr. Swanson made a comment about uh, technology. I think the, the Federal Highway Administration has recently demonstrated and has funded several pilot programs. I'm trying to think of location. I think Seattle, Portland, Dallas, there's some place in the Ohio perhaps. And what they demonstrated was the technology on your handheld device, you can be driving in traffic and it will alert you to either accidents or even congestion up ahead. It will designate alternate routes for you. It will uh, identify if there's parking garages along the way. It will tell you what the capacity of the parking garages are. It helps you make uh, plan your trip, whether you want to stay in that congestion or, uh, or bail out, take alternate routes, or turn around and go home. Um, the, uh, I'm familiar with the uh, Beauregard uh, Corridor Development Plan that the City of Alexandria is taking the lead, but also in uh, collaborative planning with um, both Arlington County, Fairfax, and others. There's a variety of transportation-related initiatives, things like uh, the trolley that's envisioned along Columbia Pike that will connect Crystal City, Pentagon City, and, and terminate close to where the Mark Center is. 
the proximity of the Beauregard to the, I, do you designate it, designate the skyline area as an activity center there, the, the Four Corners? Um, Four Corners is an activity Good. center. Okay. There's yeah. a lot of, lot of proximity there that can be like, Sherlington, I see, is, is mm -hmm. just a few uh, exits uh, down the road. When the new uh, uh, off-ramp uh, is, is built in the 16-17 time frame at 395 and Seminary, that will promote the transportation. Mm -hmm movement uh, there. I think it's probably good timing for the NCPC to affiliate ourselves and probably take full credit. There's an article in the Washington Post this morning, Express, that says DC traffic eases a bit. So perhaps this is an opportunity for us to <laughs> affiliate ourselves with that good news and perhaps distance ourselves a little bit from the Virginia bike legislation is derailed. <laughs> <laughs> thought. So thank you very much for your comments. You. It's a impressive planning. Thank you. Thanks. Your your presentation. Your being with us. We've had a full agenda today, and uh, we appreciate your steadfastness. And we are adjourned. <laughs>